Hello and welcome to Sociology 101. As you can see, we have a guest with us today. This is Dr. Joel Koretko. Welcome, Joel, to the program. Hey, Layden. Thanks for having me. I learned about you through a feed that was sent to me while I was about to go on a walk, and I go, oh, good. I get to listen while I walk somewhere. It makes my walks go faster when I don't have to think about my sweating and striving <laughs> up the hills, and I can just think about the uh, theology going through my head. And by the way, I am wearing my glasses today because somebody said they make me look smarter. And since I'm here with Joel, I need all the help I can get. Um, because J Joel, Joel is a, a scholar amongst us and I appreciate his scholarship. Um, and as a scrolling on the bottom of the screen before uh, just housekeeping here, um, those uh, who support us, thank you for your support. And if you'd like to become a monthly patron or you'd like to give, uh, you can click in the show notes. There's a link up more about how you can do that. There's also more about Joel, uh, hit a link to his uh, web web page, uh, YouTube page. You can find out more about Joel there as well. So make sure you, you check those things out. Um, but l let me tell you kind of some background here about Joel um, before I, I let him introduce himself and tell you about what he does. Um, I click on this. Uh, it was a guy named Zach who says, what's your pastor? What's the name of the show? Your, what's your pastor oh, what's has your pastor never told you? Tell you? What's, your, what's pastor your pastor didn't tell you? Tell you? Yeah. Which you, you know. should check that out. <laughs> you should check it out. There's a link in the show notes to the original video. So you can check out uh, Zach's uh, page as well. Um, Zach, Zach is not always a friend, <laughs> put it that way. Let me, let me, let me just say, he's not always friendly to my opinions. Uh, he, he has brought some critique videos a, against me. Um, and so I, I, I like uh, y'all know me. I, I like listening to people who disagree with me. I, I'm, a, I'm kind of crazy that way sometimes. Um, and so I'm listening to this thinking, you know, this could be a critique and sure enough, I, the very first thing you say is a critique of my opener. And, um, when you know you, when you put months into working together an opener and somebody who's very smart, uh, critiques you almost immediately, you know, you kind of want to just turn it off. You know, you just, oh, I'm going to listen to somebody else now. Dang it. You know, there's a little bit of, you know, pride there. I'm being honest. I almost turned you off, but I thought, you know, no, no, I'm going to listen to this guy. I'm going to, I'm going to hear him out. And so I'm listening and, and there were a few, th you, you made some critiques of my broadcast or my opener that were valid. You, you made some valid critiques, which I'm going to talk about one valid one here in a minute. But one that I don't think you understood is that you talked about when my first opener and I said, it doesn't matter how much you know Greek or how uh, you, how well you do your exegetical methodologies. Um, you you could, uh, if, if you start with the wrong presupposition, you end up with the wrong interpretation of both languages. Um, and and it, it came across, and I understand how it can come across, like the Greek doesn't matter or like exegetical methodology doesn't matter. Th that's not what I was trying to communicate. What I was trying to communicate is no how no matter how good your Greek is, uh, no matter uh, how well you do exegetical methodology, whatever it may be, um, the historical method or whatever it is, if you start with a bad presupposition, then it, you'll end up with the wrong interpretation, even with all the other stuff in place. That was the point I was trying to make, and I maybe wasn't mm -hmm. clear enough. But that that was one of the critiques that I, I wanted to make sure I pointed out. But the the area that you you did critique me on that I wish I would have known before the debate is the one I kind of want to hone in on. But before we go there, I want people to know a little bit more about you because it was what became abundantly obvious in just listening to you and Zach talk is you were reading, I mean, you're reading stuff in both Hebrew and in Greek like fluently, and you were just talking about all these different things and pulling all this um, it reminds me of when I'm talking to David Allen or Brian Wagner or these guys that know original languages and all these kinds of things. And I'm just going, okay, yeah, you lost me. Um, because one thing Dr. White critiques me of quite regularly that I agree with him about, um, is that I am not a linguistic scholar. I, I'm not a church historian. I, I cite from those people whenever I make a point in my book or in my broadcast, because I know that's not my area of expertise. And so when I hear somebody who knows what they're talking about, I, I, as a theology geek, which I am, I kind of cling to it and go, okay, what is he saying? How, do, what, how can I learn from this? What do I, what do I need to know about this? Because believe it or not, I really am a seeker of truth. I really want to know what the Bible really means. I don't want to be wrong for goodness sake. I don't want to be wrong. Uh, and so I want my audience to know a little bit more about you, Joel. And so tell us who you are, what you do. And I'm giving you permission to kind of brag on yourself here. In other words, <laughs> to, I, I know you're a humble guy, but tell us who you are and what you do. Sure. Yeah. Um, I'll let you fill in any uh, gaps you want to then. I don't know how much I want to yeah, brag on myself. But uh, yeah, I am uh, Joel Koretko. 
Uh, yeah, I am assistant professor of biblical studies at Northwest Seminary and College. I'm also an adjunct professor in religious studies at Trinity Western and also a uh, professor of biblical studies adjunct as well at Acts Seminaries. Uh, yeah, I focus my research or have focused a lot of my research in Septuagint studies, um, so Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, that said, though, I'm I'm just a Bible nerd, like the, many of the rest of you. <laughs> uh, just I just love studying the Bible. This has been my passion for a very, very, very long time. And I've kind of gone the academic route. Um, didn't know that I was always going to do that, but that's what I've, I've done. And so, uh, yeah, I've I've got a uh, well, it's, it's called a defil when you're when you're over at Oxford, but right. um, PhD, like PhD is what you probably right. understand out Oxford. here. So, P, right. uh, yeah, same thing um, from the University of Oxford in Oriental now, Studies. Now, can can PhDs from Oxford or wherever Cambridge, wherever, can they be wrong? Hmm? Well, can they ever be, be wrong? Can they ever be oh, wrong? Can I be wrong? Yeah, is that what you're I mean, yeah, no, I yeah, can't I mean, be wrong. No, <laughs> no, no. Other, I, I, what I'm, what, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, what I'm, I'm, I'm cutting off at the edges is that people will say, "Oh, he's claiming authority, appealing to authority. He's appealing yeah. to a PhD or a doctorate of philosophy at, from Oxford. Therefore, he must be right." And and that's just the opposite. We're, we're not saying that people people with all kinds of PhDs can be wrong. Um, but what's important is that I, I don't appeal to myself as the authority. I appeal to people who actually do this for a living as the authority. And so that's why Joel, you're here is because you know, the original languages, you do this for a living. Okay. You, you translate these things for a living. So you are what I would consider an expert in this, this field. And so that's why you're here. Um, and just, just so the audience knows, that's why I picked Joel for this program. <laughs> so j just so you're aware and Joel doesn't always agree with Leighton flowers. Okay. So, no. um, uh, and, and matter of fact, I, I probably shouldn't have said that some people just assume that if I'm retweeting you or that I'm putting you on the program, it's because you're just this fanboy that loves Leighton and a provisionist and just would say anything to per defend me against the mean old James white out there. And that's just not the case, the situation. He's on Zach's program. Zach has brought critique of me in the past. Um, Joel had as many critiques for me in that original broadcast as he did for James White. Um, and so I just want that to be very clearly stated. Is that fair, Joel? Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I, I don't even, I don't think I'm subscribed to you on YouTube or anything. I, Why I have not, Joel? Video. That's offensive, <laughs> man. Come on. <laughs> Subscribe I, I, to my broadcast. All, all I'm saying, I, I will probably after this, but <laughs> but um, uh, I, I'm saying that because I th I've seen some of your videos before, but this isn't. I, I yeah, I don't follow your your channel or your debates or what's going on with you or and, and James or anyone. So yeah, it's not. I'm not coming in here just to 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 bolster. bolster not, like. Yeah, right, right. So I, I'm just trying to point out this is just not a biased uh, person that I'm having on here. This is somebody I think who can objectively evaluate where we're coming from and give his, his critique from, uh, you know, his, his, his background. So that's, that's the goal. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play a clip from James White. Cause he actually saw my retweet of you and Zach talking, um, and he commented on it. So I want to let you have an opportunity to reply to him. Um, but before we do that, I want to point out what I said I was going to point out the critique mm -hmm. that I thought was a valid critique of my debate. Um, which really was not m as much about my opener as it was about the cross-examination where Dr. White was really pushing me on the Pontas Pos, you know, in verse 45, uh, the participles, um, aorist active participles. Um, and, and he really was trying to get me to explain how it is that um, the, two, the two references to Pos were not the same group of people. And because the way I was understanding it, I'll put it up on the screen there, is that the first pos, pontos, and pos, the second one, everyone, all and everyone, was referring to two different groups, the whole Israel the first time, and then everyone who listens and learns the second time. And I just took it as what, for example, what Paul says in Romans 10 when he says, yes, all, all of Israel has heard. And so that's what I was taking that to mean, which I've heard some other scholars that I've talked to and that I've read take it the same kind of way, that God has taught all of Israel, those who listen and learn will come to him, okay? And what you were showing me through your conversation with Zach and what I heard from Dr. Al Garza, who is also another linguist, was it pretty much explaining 
you didn't need to do that, Leighton. You didn't need to, you didn't need to make that distinction. The all can still be referenced to the everyone because you're referring to all who belong to God. The question of the debate is whether they belong to God because they're unconditionally elected or because they freely believe. And that's not even addressed in that question. And so you could have just conceded, yes, the first pontos is the same as the second pos. It is referring to all who belong to God. And that doesn't answer the question as if they belong to God because they were chosen before they were born and effectually caused to, or whether or not they belong to God because they freely heard and listened to his voice. And so when I heard that, I just kind of go, oh, duh, that would have been so much easier. <laughs> so, uh, and so that's that's where I go, man, that's why you do this. This is why you do these kinds of engagements. Because once I heard you explain that, I go, I didn't even need to really do that. I, I could have just conceded that point. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, maybe I'm right about that. I, I, after hearing you out and after hearing your explanation from the original languages in the old Testament, I think you're probably right. You've convinced me that you're probably right about that. I need to make an edit in my book, <laughs> by the way. So <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, <laughs> oh, I know the pain of that. I'm sorry. Yeah. I was just like, oh, okay. I gotta go back and <laughs> fix that. Um, but I'm, but that's not concern for me. My, my concern is truth. I want people to understand truth and the easiest way to understand this. And so I thought, man, I want to have a conversation with this guy. I want to figure this out because um, it makes a lot more sense from your perspective and probably a lot easier to defend. Um, so before we jump into the thing with Dr. White, which we'll go over some of that, I imagine he'll hit on some of that. And I don't know that we'll need to go over all of it again, mm -hmm. but is, is that a fair representation of kind of what you were critiquing and, and what I'm realizing now is probably my mistake? Yeah, no, I think you've, you've, you've pretty much got it there. Um, really just briefly aside, just to make sure, I, I'm not sure you might've said that the, the, the Pandas and Pas were, were aorist. I, I'm not, I thought I heard you say that those that's actually the, 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 the listening and the learning are the participles. So just as long as we're, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's why, that, sure. and that's why you're here. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, why you're here. Yeah. To, it, I, I, so I started to come back. Somebody cut me because I said conjugating verbs mm -hmm. or conjugating nouns. I got one of them wrong. Oh. You do one to the other. And, and declining it, nouns, yeah. yeah. Declining versus conjugating. I got it wrong. Yeah. And because I took, I took languages, 20 years ago. And, and I took two classes just like you're required to, to get your, your, you know, your doctorate and what well, your DBN. I was doing my master's at the time. And so, um, and so people said, well, you don't know Greek and you don't know this. I said, yeah, duh. I know that I, I that's, I don't, I, yeah, I can get the tools out and I can still remember some of my vocabulary and go through it. But it's like people who took, you know, Spanish back when they were in high school. Do you know some Spanish words still? Yeah. But if you're going to speak the language, aren't you going to get somebody who actually knows, uh, Spanish fluently? Of course you are. Um, and so that, that's, I've never claimed to be a Greek scholar. The, the fact that white makes big hay of that, what fine, he's, he, I'm drooling on my keyboard as we speak, as I say, I, I, that doesn't, it does not change the point of up, up for debate as far as I'm concerned. Now I know why he likes to focus on Greek because he's taught Greek recently and he knows Greek. And so he can speak the language a lot more fluently. And so he makes a lot of points in my estimation that have really nothing to do with our points of contention. I think they're red herrings for the most part. I think that doesn't mean there's something valid points that you can make with regard to Greek. But again, that's why I appeal to the scholars, not to myself as the scholar. Um, and so I mean, just, that's, just today, today that's, Yeah. I mean, today that's kind of the point of contention though, is that he did appeal to Greek as a claim that you were wrong in your argumentation and conclusions. Um, and so he, he did appeal to that as the indicator. And what we're going to see is that it just doesn't hold up what he was saying and really um, he shouldn't have done that. Um, and so he had some comments uh, to me, uh, towards me um, in that regard as well. Um, but yeah, so sometimes it does come into play and it did come into play in the debate uh, a few times, but particularly in, in one uh, one instance. Right. Okay. Well, let's just jump right in and let you respond to Dr. White as we go through this. I've pulled out some clips based upon his, you know, critique of you and, uh, and you'll see a little, uh, stop between each one and I'll try to pull those down and just let you comment as we go. So here we go. Hey, just before hey, we uh, do that. I oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Just before we do that, I just want to emphasize to those who are, who are watching, um, you just said something that like you're in pursuit of truth. You want to know what the text says. I, I just want to, to second that like my entire journey, um, in studying the Bible and in trying to figure out what the Bible says, uh, it, it, I, that is what I care about. I care about what does the text say? How do we know what it says? 
and that's where I stand uh, or fall. Like I, I, that's the hill I'm willing to die on. And so, um, yeah, if it, it, what data can you present to me to show me that this is what the text says? Um, that's always yeah. what I'm looking for. Um, and so, yeah, just so that well, the audience and I knows sense me that. a little bit. I, yeah. Yeah. I sense that with you and Zach as well. I mean, I sense that you are you're good brothers. You're not, you're not coming at white personally. Uh, you no. really are talking about the topic. And so I, I appreciate that. It's one of the reasons that you're here as well. Um, but, and we will, I do want to hear about your journey, kind of your own story. Mm. Uh, I know you were a Calvinist, a big DA Carson fan. Um, and, and, and I want to hear more about that because you touched on it briefly, but I didn't ever really hear the whole story, but I, I want to get this stuff with the Greek out of the way first. And then maybe if we have time at the end here, we'll, we'll go through some of your journey and tell a little bit more about that. So no all problem right. at all. That sounds great. Here we go. Webcast was done. A, a conversation was done that. Leighton retweeted. He wasn't involved with it, I don't think, anyways. And, you know, when he retweeted it, retweeted it, he says, here's a real scholar, you know, correcting White's misapprehensions and all the rest of this kind of stuff. Because Leighton can't do that. He, he's, he does not have the capacity to do that. The AI didn't have the capacity to do that. Nobody in his group has the capacity to do that. And well, I don't know about nobody in my group. There are some Greek, Greek uh, guys in my group. And the AI thing, he's talking about a Twitter thing where somebody else posted something about AI and then I reposted this other tweet about AI because I asked the question about verse 45. And it basically said the same things that I've heard you saying because the Greek, even from AI, doesn't say what it needs to say to get to the conditionality of the choice. But anyway, moving on. And so they've got to find something. And so here's some pastor. I'd never heard of any of these guys. Some pastor was interviewing an ex-Calvinist. Well, that really helps. Um, and this is the stuff that Layton's put out. So I'm like, well, all right. I, I, I would like to hear someone try to actually interact with the text on a level that clearly Leighton Flowers is not able to do. None of his minions have shown themselves capable of doing. Don't call them minions. They're smarter than that. Uh, and I'll, yeah. No, and I, I, I think it's kind I of, I would say, I would say, I hope he does. I hope he has you on. I would love to see a discussion between you two. I honestly would go, go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it, it's just, it's going to become funny because he turns it off. <laughs> he doesn't listen to, uh, to, to it. He just, he, he, he says, well, as he long as you're agreeing somebody. with, as long as you're yeah. agreeing with him, he wants to hear you out. That, yeah. That's what he meant. Um, so I'd love to see what someone would come up with. And so I started listening to it on the drive out of Houston today before the um, roof fell apart. Um, that was slightly distracting. Um, and what I hear is this this guy starts off, uh, again, don't even remember his name. Never heard of him. Um, and he says, now I'm probably undercutting myself here, but but I'm not a theologian. Well, you're an ex-Calvinist. That <laughs> already proved that. But anyway, I'm not a theologian. I'm a I'm a biblical scholar. Okay, all right. Does he not realize there's disciplines, different disciplines? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Explain to him in the academic world the different disciplines. I I mean I, I'm not I don't want to be mean, but that's just yeah very disrespectful for him to say it that way. But. Yeah, and I did very much frame what I was saying in that sense. So for those who aren't oh aware of how universities are structured uh, and how there are different uh, departments in universities. So if you're a theologian, typically you're going to be in the philosophy, theology department, whereas if you're a biblical studies um, focus uh, or religious studies focus, you're going to be in a different department, like not even the same, necessarily the same room, same offices, like you're going to be a different place sometimes, often. And so these are de separate disciplines. Uh, if you're a theologian, you're publishing in certain journals. You're being peer reviewed by scholars of a different caliber than somebody who is going to be doing biblical studies. These are these are they're separate. Now, I understand that people read the Bible and they go, you have to do theology when you read the Bible. It's like that's absolutely true. I do theology um, when it comes to my own faith, when it comes to preaching sermons in my church, um, when it comes to teaching in the classroom. But when it comes to academics, publishing, peer reviewed studies, uh, that is a, that is a different game. And so. Uh, they're, they're different in that respect. Uh, so I, I focus on text. What does the text in front of me say? What is the language? What is the history? What is the context, social context? Like everything you could possibly ask about this specific text in front of me, that's my focus. But then the idea of extrapolating that, bringing that to philosophical assumptions about God, um, which there are, there are many different things you have to consider, that's a different field. And so sometimes these 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 fields intersect and they engage and everybody is doing uh, every biblical studies person is going to be doing some theology 
uh, in their mind. And everybody who's a theologian is going to be doing some biblical studies and thinking about the text. But as academic disciplines, they're separate. Yeah, and, and I think that's obvious to most people in the academic world, at least. And so uh, I know it's true at Trinity Seminary, where I work. Uh, I'm, I'm in the theology department, not the biblical studies department. There is overlap, obviously, but yeah, um, that should that should be a given. All right, moving on. But then he says, and I, I was looking forward to listening to this debate because I haven't done much work in John 6. <laughs> okay, so you're an ex-Calvinist, but you haven't done much work in John 6, which makes me go, uh, you were a Calvinist, but you really haven't dealt with John 6, but you're an ex-Calvinist now, which, you know, I'd think that if you're, you know, leaving the Reformed faith, John 6 would certainly... Anyway, so I'm going, this is getting weirder. And so they played their first clip, and it included my, just in passing, making reference to the presence of two present participles. You want to stop okay, there before we get, yeah, yeah, before yeah. we get to the participles, so just... real... Yeah. yeah I'm go ahead gonna, on the John six thing. Yeah. Yeah. Wanna... So uh, this is kind of, this kind of connects to what I was just saying about academic study of the Bible. Uh, when I say as someone who works in biblical studies and writes, publishes, um, teaches, when I say I haven't done a lot of work, I don't mean I've never studied a passage. Well, I, it doesn't mean that I haven't, put in uh spent i don't know a hundred plus hours into a passage like john six um that would be considered a little bit of work uh, i haven't written commentaries on john six i haven't written published articles on john six i'm not a johannine scholar and so i'm not going to claim more than is due to me um and i don't want to pretend that i'm something i'm not but, but i never said at any point that i that I have never studied John six. Uh, and I was a through and through Calvinist. Um, I understand that he might not think that, um, but John six was a huge text for me for very, for very many years in that um, theological and reading tradition. Um, and then over time, I recognize that's not what, I don't think that's what it says. And so uh, that's all I'm saying there. So to say that I've never done work in it um, again, I'm, I'm speaking from an academic perspective. So for example, I, uh, I have a book up um, the, the stack there. Uh, can you see my hand? Yeah, there. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that was a monograph I wrote that is based on my dissertation. And so that is something I would say I've put a lot of work in and that I'm an expert in. And now we're talking 5,000 plus hours, um, like years, probably seven years of my life went to those ideas. Uh, that is considered yeah. a lot of work. An article, if you're going to produce an article for a journal, you're probably looking at about 500 hours. Um, if you want to do it well, you have to read everything that's been written ever on the subject. Uh, you need to read it in multiple uh, German, French, English, whatever's been written. Uh, you have to synthesize all that data. You have to then create, uh, not only create your own ideas, uh, but then engage with all of that peer-reviewed research. Then you need to whittle it down, edit, 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 realize you're wrong about things, change them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and yeah, that's the process. So a little bit of work on John six means I've still thought about it tons. It's just, I'm not doing that. So right. it's just a, a different way of thinking. And I understand that some people don't, don't think in these terms. So maybe I could have been. Yeah. There. Well, um, it, Braxton Hunter, the, Trin the our president uh, at Trinity seminary where, where I work was talking to me on the phone the other day. Cause he'd heard that. And, uh, he said it reminded him of what Jordan Peterson uh, you know, was asked a question on a kind of a gotcha question by this lady, a journalist saying, um, have you studied global, global climate change or something like that? And he said, I haven't studied it much. And then she's kind of like pushing on him, like he like talking down to him, like he doesn't know anything and kind of pushing in him on it. And said, you know, what have you read on that? Oh, about, you know, about 300 books or so on the subject, but I'm not really a scholar. <laughs> so he's read, he's read <laughs> widely more than any other average person has by far, but he doesn't consider that he's a scholar in the subject because he, he knows what it takes to truly be a scholar in a particular subject. And so I thought that was kind of uh, humorous as well. All right, mo yeah. moving on to the next point, I think where he brings up, Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say being an expert in something is a, truly an immense amount of work. Uh, I yes. consider myself an expert in very few things. Uh, if I would consider myself an expert in the covenant code of Exodus as it relates to the Greek translation. <laughs> I'm an expert in that, but <laughs> like yeah. it's, a, you don't throw around expert very, uh, lightly in scholarly discussions. 
Yeah. And, and when you have to, you know, interpret that much from original languages, that's you become an expert in their languages because you're having to do that translation work and all that, that goes with it. So yeah, mm -hmm. that totally makes, makes sense. All right. He, this is when he gets into the participle uh, comment. Mm -hmm. And it included my, just in passing, making reference to the presence of two present participles. <clears throat> and they stopped the clip. And he goes, no, I, I want to be nice here, I, you know, but, but, but I still get the feeling that White really understands languages at all, because there's lots of different ways to say things. And later on, he says, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but at the end of the debate, when he, when he criticizes Leighton Flowers uh, for what he said about, um, when, when, he, when he talking about active verbs and when he talks about participles, it's just really clear. He just does not understand linguistics. And I'm sitting here going, reach forward, click, no reason to continue. Why? Well, a couple things. Um, I explained the importance of the present participles in John 6 in my book, Don by the Father, um, 33 years ago. And it was painfully clear that neither of these guys have ever taken the time to read anything I've written on the subject. Uh, Potter's Freedom, Don by the Father, God's Sovereign Grace, nothing. Um, and so he's sitting here going, wait, it just, just doesn't understand linguistics when he hasn't done the homework enough to know what he's even talking about. And if he hasn't done work in John 6, then how could you, I guess he just, missed the idea um that uh oh it... yeah uh go, we stopped there for a sec sure yeah yeah um yeah i guess we could stop there for a sec so yeah he's he's making i think actually we do need to continue to the next clip now that i think about it um i wanted to talk about the heiress before i go into an explanation okay yeah we're gonna move yeah, on. if you've not done work on john six then maybe you don't realize um the fact that the john uses the heiress when he's talking about false faith and that the present participles are emphasizing true faith. So the one, the one believing in me, uh, the one gazing upon the sun, um, these types of things, you, you're not even aware of it, but that's my ignorance, not your ignorance. Cause you didn't do your homework. And then the representation of my correction of Layton's error was just a complete mis misunderstanding. He, he just, he didn't even <clears throat> bother to listen carefully to the debate. So it's like, why bother? There's, there's no reason to do so. Um, okay. so, okay. Let's stop. Yeah, let's stop there. Okay. So I, I did listen to the debate, uh, carefully and I, um, there are a few things just to point out here, um, with, with James, uh, first off, typically in scholarly discussions, you don't say you didn't read my book 30 years ago, then you can't understand this. Um, if James has, uh, an opinion that is really just absolutely obvious to to the text of John 6 and to the Gospel of John, you should be able to turn to at least some Reformed commentaries or other commentaries and see them re repeating that same idea. Um, it would be evident if it's so, he's saying here it's absolutely obvious and that anyone who's done work in John, I reiterate, I have done work in John. I've read John many times in Greek. I've read John 6 many, many times. I've studied John 6, read articles on John 6, read commentaries on John 6. Like, I have done that work. Uh, I have not read James White's books. Um, and uh, I actually have now read some of it. I, uh, I have. Okay. <laughs> From, matter of fact, uh, uh, just so people know real quick, Joel, before you continue, because I, I know yeah. the average layman watching this may or may not follow what that what he just said. And so yeah. here's, here's a clip from his book. And so let me kind of reemphasize what he's saying. He says the, the, the use of the present tense indicating an ongoing living faith versus a false, false faith, which is almost always placed in the aorist tense is his, his claim. So what he seems to be suggesting is that the ongoing faith is the real faith. It's the true faith. And almost always in the book of John, when it's referred to in the aorist tense, it's a false faith because it's not a continuing faith. Mm -hmm. And so that's his claim. And, and so making sure people understand what it is that Dr. White is claiming and what you're contending with. So proceed, yeah, go I'll ahead. I'll back up even a little bit more than that and just kind of give just a couple seconds on tense and what we're talking about there so people don't aren't confused. Okay, okay so uh, we'll just define a few terms here. Participle is a term just for like an ing verb, like walking, running, swimming, okay? Uh, and so we're talking about those kinds of, of, of actions, that kind of grammatical category. And then tense, uh, present tense and aorist tense in Greek are just different ways of conceptualizing an action, 
Okay, so how do you think about oh, the way an action's being done? And so if you're thinking about the present tense, I, uh, the typical example you hear from in Greek grammars or lectures is uh, of a parade. So if you if you are walking in a parade and you're looking around, everything's happening around you, it's ongoing, you're right in it. That would be like the idea of the present tense, the imperfective. It's it's going on right now. Whereas the aorist is is more of a undefined um, conceptualization or a whole picture in that you're uh, up in the blimp, you're looking down, you see the whole parade, all of what it is, and it's not going into and being within that action. It's just looking at it as a whole. So the idea of like, uh, like if you were to go to English, just as a comparison by analogy, like he walked versus he was walking. Like he was walking, right, like right. He's, he's, he's ongoing, he's doing that thing. A walked, it's just this uh, undefined, right? Or um, broad broad picture. Um, and so that's kind of, that that's what we're talking about here. These are different ways of conceptualizing action in Greek. And there are many different factors that go into when something will be a present tense or an aorist tense. Um, most of all, or I shouldn't say most of all, my, my, a lot of the time it's going to be an author's own choice or a, someone who's speaking in Greek, uh, composing in Greek, their choice. So you can say something um, with the aorist tense or the present tense, and really it's just up to them and how they want to conceptualize that action. Um, I'm trying. Oh, what's the, oh, I'm just thinking, an example is coming to me now from uh, from from the Gospels when it talks about. Uh, oh, I might get this one wrong. I don't want to get it wrong on, on the spot. But I think it's the <laughs> take, up your, take up your cross and follow me. And so between Gospels, one is uh, one is aorist and one is present. So one is like it is is kind of looking in on like this. You're in it. You're you're you're, you're taking the cross up. You're following. And I'm I'm not getting the verb right. So which 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 verb is the aorist or present? So please, I'm saying I I'm not looking at this text right now from memory. <laughs> right, right. But uh, uh, but then another gospel is the aorist tense, and so it's like they're just conceptualizing the same it's the same words of Jesus, but differently. Right? They're conceptualizing right. as one is just looking at you're taking up a cross. That's what we're talking about. The other one is it's looking at the inward action of your you're carrying it. You're, you're carrying this cross. Anyways. Right. So uh, you can do different things as an author in in, in Greek, um, and it's really just up to the whim of the author. However, there are also other cases. So, for example, in the Gospel of John, uh, it, depending on what word you're using, um, uh, so let's say the word eat, uh, if you're going to speak about eat uh, in past tense, uh, or you're going to use the aorist, and it's going it's, it's to be uh, phagomek. Uh, but if you if you're going to be speaking in the present, it's simply going to be uh, trogo, and so it's just because of the lexeme, uh, it's just like the the, the the word that you choose. Right, right. Uh, it, it will it, it will depend uh, what uh, if it's going to be aorist or present sometimes. So there are there are multiple there are many factors, and I'm just giving you two ideas here. There are lots of factors that go into deciding when things are conceptualized in one way or another. Um, right. And this is a feature of the Greek language. So that was a lot of, of talk there. I, I understand that. Um, but I'm giving you just an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about tense here. Uh, this is a very flexible thing. Um, and you're not typically going to find um, kind of like these, these dogged uh, rules uh, like, like James is saying here. Okay. So hopefully that's somewhat clear. Now, what... What he was saying to Leighton in the debate was very specific. So uh, even if all that didn't make sense to you, please follow right now, okay? He said, and what I critiqued was, John 6.45, Leighton is wrong in his application of the, the, that verse because uh, of... Uh, because in, in the original debate, he said because of, uh, he, he mistook that they're 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 part they're participles and not a finite verb. So Leighton assumed it was a finite verb and not a participle. Therefore, he was wrong. In his correction, now what, to me, he said because aorist um, the aorist tense and then aorist participles here refer to false faith, and that is what we have here on the screen for you. However, hear this: John six forty five has two participles, the one hearing, the one learning. They are both aorist participles. Therefore, what he said 
makes no sense uh, in in um, trying to contradict Leighton because he would be stating, based on his argumentation, that the one hearing and learning from the Father, that's saying false faith, if the er this whole aorist thing stands, which it doesn't, by the way. I'm, I'm get, kind of still getting there. But that he would bring that up in the debate and say, I've got you, Leighton, because of this, and that's apparently his argument. He's actually shooting himself in the foot because he's then saying uh, that the hearing and the learning are false faith if this whole heiress thing stands. And so uh, this, this is why in my original commentary with Zach on what your pastor didn't tell you, I went, I don't think, I don't think he understands um, the, the kind of the ins and outs of the Greek language. I'm sure he can read the Greek New Testament. I'm sure that he can, he, he has a, he has a somewhat a knowledge of, of, of it, but um, this statement is just incorrect. And so you can actually go into the Gospel of John if you want. And I actually would really recommend any of you who have Bible software to do this. You can do this without knowing Greek. If you open up, so I have Logos. If you open up Logos, you click search. You go up, you go morph, morphological. It just says morph, I think. And uh, you you enter in pistuo, pistevo, if you, depending on how you pronounce things. I use a reconstructed for century koine, um, but pistuo. And then you're just going to tag it as aorist um, and then check. You just click. And you can have an English translation brought up there, all the English brought up. And go through them. Walk through and see if what he's saying here actually holds true, that um, the aorist tense is used mostly for false faith. And I'm telling you, it's just it's just abundantly clear it's not. I, this isn't a matter of scholarly debate. Um, this is this Well, not is only is it not true, just generally speaking, it's not true in the very verse that he's appealing to, yes. verse 45, because obviously even on his interpretation, verse 45 is speaking of the elect uh, on his on his reading. The unconditionally mm -hmm. elected ones who are irresistibly graced, those are the ones who are taught of God and who learn from him, and therefore being referenced to the aorist would disprove his entire position of mm -hmm. that being the reason that he thinks that I was wrong by appealing to the fact that they were active um, mm -hmm. versus passive. Um, and so that that's the point you were you were bringing up with Zach, right? Yeah. So his his own point, it, yeah. It, it, he undercuts himself in in his his correction because he never initially told you why you were wrong, but now that he's told us and pointed to his book and here's his book, uh, it's just it's it's not true. And so uh, you might wonder, okay, well, Joel, uh, are there other errors, uh with believing in the Gospel of John um, that? That, that, that don't refer to false faith. I'll give you a few, okay? I just have it, I did exactly what I just said about pulling up Logos, I'm doing that now. I've just pulled it up in front of me. So John 1, 7, uh, this one came for a witness in order that he could testify about the light so that all would believe through him. Is that false faith? No, it's, it's aorist, it's just believing. Um, the beginning of the signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Is his disciples believe false faith? Uh, maybe uh, if you want to, th that's kind of a strange thing to think. Uh, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture. Arist. <laughs> so it's, it's not false faith, right? And like, you could just go through the gospel of John. Um, I'm sure some of them are false faith, but again, it's the Arist has nothing to do with it. This is just a way of conceptualizing the action. What about what about towards the end? I know I always reference to I've, all these things have been written so that you may believe, um, mm -hmm. and you know, and then it, it goes on to say that um, you know the, the, that you may believe and have life in His name. Um, I'm mm -hmm. just curious: is that in also the aorist or reference in the aorist there in 29 and 30? Yeah, that's a that's a great uh, point. Um, so I was on Zach's show yesterday, and I, I mentioned that one, John 20 31, uh, and uh, it. It could be in the aorist, but there's a textual variant there. And so I said that it was in the aorist because the list in front of me and the way that Logos has par parsed it for me um, without giving me these dis distinctions, um, uh, it, it parses it as an aorist. So it, yes, it see, appears to be an aorist, but there is some doubt about the textual um, uh, accuracy of that. However, if you go one verse break, or two verses before, it says, Jesus. Uh, so John 20, 29, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, have you believed? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. That's actually a participle a, <laughs> of yeah. Pistevo. Eris right. participle. Eris is participle. Yeah. Right. And so it, this just doesn't hold up. This is not how the Eris 
works in Greek. And so the point that I made and that you tweeted, uh, it stands. This is not how the Greek language works. You could say John is doing something like I could, sorry, I, I could imagine a world where John is using a cipher. Like he's like doing a code and like every time he uses an aorist, it's unbelieving. And every time he uses present, it's believing. You could imagine a world where that's true. And John is a really interesting author. I wouldn't put something like that past past him, but that is yeah. not happening. Um, that is not happening. So you could, th there's a world I could imagine where that's true. That is not true in John and it's not true in the New Testament. And it's just not true because that's not how Greek um, uh, tense functions. It's just, that's just not how people, how the language is used. And so um, it's demonstrably false from what James right. said. He has shot his, himself in the foot because he said uh, about the participles in John 6, 45, uh, that uh, he did, I guess he didn't recognize that they're aorist, perhaps. I don't know, uh, but they're aorist. So that would actually prove his own point wrong. And so this is just not correct. And so I'll bring one more point up before we can move on. I know I've really um, been beating this to death a bit, but it is really important because he, uh, before I get to my last point here, I, I watched the debate and, you know, like I said, I wanted to try and learn some things and like, I, I just, I'm interested in this and um, it's a, Calvinism was such a big part of my life for so long. And so I just thought, okay, I, this popped up in my feed. Let's check it out. And, and then going through it and then hearing this. And when he started talking about Greek like this, and he gave you this kind of gotcha at the end, like, oh, he doesn't understand a finite verb versus a participle. It's like, like that That's problematic if you are signaling to your audience that you are the authority on Greek here and that you know something that Leighton doesn't, and we all don't in the audience, that is. Uh, but you're completely misinformed on it. It, it, it does not stand at all what you're saying. Um, that's that's you, it's not responsible. It's yeah, the, be responsible. Yeah, this is where, I mean, because I don't, you know, I'm not fluent in Greek and because I'm not real confident in, in Greek by any means, even, even from the teachers that I learned from, we never learned to really get up and pronounce the words correctly that we did most of our, you know, all on paper and things like that. So I just never really got a strong handle on Greek by any means. Um, nowadays, obviously with all the tools that are out there, you know, just like with Logos and everything, you can just look it all up and just read for yourself, but it's still, still you're going to be short falling. Unless you're doing what you're doing where you're, you know, you're living is to translate the languages. Um, you know, you're not going to have a full working knowledge unless you're fluent and, and like, like you do it for a living like you do. Um, and so whenever somebody like Dr. White speaks real dogmatically about it, even I, even though I, there, I've kind of come to distrust Dr. White on a lot of issues because of the way he's treated me over the years, um, there's still a part of me that's going, well, maybe he's got a point. I, I mean, I don't know. It sounds like he's really confident of this, so maybe he's just right. And then I'll call up Brian or one of my other friends that's in Greek, and he's just going, no, he's 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 dogmatically stating a Greek thing that's true, possibly, as if it's as if it proves his interpretation, but it has nothing to do with the interpretation. It just has to do with his own theology being read into the text, and he's citing some things about Greek to make himself sound better about it, and it has nothing to do with it. And so, ever since you know Brian and others have told me that, I'm just like, okay, well, I have to second guess everything he says because he's just using his Greek knowledge or his ability to quote Greek or cite things about Greek as if it's proving his interpretation when it may or may not be. And we don't know unless, you know, those of us that don't know Greek very well, we don't know unless we go check the sources. And and that's what it seems like you're saying is that when he speaks dogmatically about something as if the Greek language proves his point theologically, then someone like you has to speak up because you know better. That's what yeah. it seems like you're saying. Yeah. And it's one of the, even the reasons that I, that, 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 so Zach and I are friends and I was just messaging him privately and I went, man, this is, did you watch that? Did did you see this thing on YouTube? Because this is that was shocking to me. Like, and the, did did you see the kind of things that were being argued there? And uh, that ended up being why we did the review. It's like, oh, let's let's talk about it then, um, because it, it just came across as, as really irresponsible. Um, uh, especially when you're there's you have a big audience. You you both have big audiences. You, a lot of people are are paying attention to this, and so yeah. you want to give good scholarship you want to give good argumentation you want you want to if you're going to be citing greek you you had better as he said to me do your homework right um, yeah, and yeah. So i'll say one more point here 
Um, that so maybe you think, even though we said I'm not a, a latent fanboy, uh, <laughs> maybe you think that I have got a, I've got a, a bone to pick here uh, uh, with reform theology or something because I'm not reformed anymore in my in my soteriology. Uh, maybe you think I'm 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 out to get to get white or something like that, and that this is some this is really debatable. It's just up for debate. It is not, and and here's I'm going to show you why. So. You, if you're reformed, I assume you've heard of D.A. Carson. D.A. Carson is one of the biggest um, biblical scholars, theologians in the reformed faith today. D.A. Carson is someone who I absolutely adored for many, many years, and I still have a great respect for him. Um, actually, he he was the first dean of the school that I work at now, <laughs> uh, which is kind of cool. Um, and he was the person who took his job is actually one of my mentors. Uh, so mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of cool that way. Uh, the guy that I'm co-writing a book with right now, believe it or not. So yeah, uh, that's beside the point. All I'm saying is that, uh, that DA Carson was huge for me. I listened to everything that he, that he produced online. I, I, I read all of his books. I, I, I'm probably, I wouldn't be sitting here today if DA Carson didn't exist. I don't think I would. Uh, he, he was very formative for me, um, as a, ref, a young guy who was into reform theology and studying the Bible. And so D.A. Carson has written one of the most beloved commentaries on the Gospel of John. Uh, so it's uh, from 1991, I believe, the, the, the first edition. And so James should know Carson's commentary on John. If anyone is in the Reformed tradition commenting on John, you must read D.A. Carson on John. You cannot avoid it. Uh, people who are not Reformed, read D.A. Carson on John. It is a very good commentary. I will now quote to you from D.A. Carson's work on the Gospel of John on this exact subject. D.A. Carson says, It can easily be shown that John elsewhere in his Gospel can use either tense, present aorist, to refer to both coming to faith and continuing in the faith. That's a uh, commentary on 2031.1 from his 1991 commentary, which has been probably revised a few times since. D.A. Carson directly states that what James is saying is incorrect here. He's reformed. He's like the head of the gospel coalition or something. This is just not correct. And so it is. Okay. So now let me say something um, on James's side. It is OK to be incorrect. I have been incorrect many times. I have published things that I wish I didn't because I got things wrong. I've said things, I got things wrong. It's just okay to be wrong. Um, this one, it was just wrong. And that's okay. We all do things, we all mess things up. We all have bad ideas. We all, like, that is totally okay. And so no one's like, I'm not here to like beat up and say James White's the worst or anything like that. It's just, he is not right on this. He needs to do his homework and do more work probably work more in Greek and think some more about these kinds of concepts. Um, but particularly here, this is incorrect and it would just be best for him to go, okay, I was wrong here. We can move on. Um, and, and I think the Leighton, you'd be go, you'd probably go, sure. Great. Sounds good. You got, uh, thank you for taking that. Well, I'm, yeah. I'm wrong all the time. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm wrong. So I'm always getting things wrong. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was a Calvinist for 10 years for goodness sake. How, look how Me wrong too. I could be. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I, I make mistakes. Yeah. That's not, that's not, that's a part of it. But the, but at the, the difference at the same is, time, again, just, just by the way, yeah. I, I, I am not against Calvinists. Uh, I said this in my friend, my stream with, uh, with um, Zach yesterday. Uh, some of my best friends are Calvinists. Uh, I had yeah, two here. hour coffee yeah. with my, with my friends yesterday morning and some of them are Calvinists and they're awesome. And so I'm not, I'm not against Calvinism or Calvinists or something. I don't think that's what the Bible teaches. And I actually would prefer that we go away from that. I don't think it's the best. Um, but I, these are my friends still, and I understand why people believe what they believe. And I'm yeah. not, I'm yeah. Well, and, and, and for those that are Calvinists that, that um, want to strengthen their position, they don't want to use bad arguments to strengthen their position. So if you're a good Calvinist, then you wouldn't want to make a bad Greek argument um, to strengthen your position because if it's proven wrong, then it makes your position look bad. So he, actually Joel is doing all of you Calvinists who are watching this a big favor because if you repeat what White said to what people who know what they're talking about, you'll be able to get your, you know, 
uh, correction right there on the spot. Like if Joel ever had knowledge, the knowledge of Joel on the stage, I would have been able to immediately call him out or correct him because I would have had the working knowledge to do that. And so, uh, I'm, he's, Joel is saving you, uh, th that, that embarrassment of, of repeating white's mistakes when you're talking to somebody who may talk, know what they're talking about with original languages. So you can thank him, uh, later for, for helping you out. You're actually, he's actually helping you make your cases stronger. Um, not, not necessarily weaker. All right, let, let's continue on with Dr. White's critique and, um, we'll, we'll go as far as we can here. And then I also want to ask you a little bit more about your own journey as well, but let's, mm -hmm. uh, let's go a little bit further with Dr. White's commentary. Over in the Greek, you will see, um, you can see the articles, the one coming and the one believing. These are the article before, here's the participle here and here. So these are relevant to what I was just saying about the Septuagint scholar thinking this means I don't know anything about Greek or something. I don't know. <clears throat> the one coming, the one believing, this type of language is absolutely vital to understand in the Gospel of John, not only in chapter 6 but in 8, 10, 17, um, also in other parts of John, hearing likewise becomes like uh, seeing with the John chapter 9 with the blind man, but being able to hear. Why don't you hear the words I'm speaking to you? Um, John uses these forms to talk about true saving faith. So the one coming to me will never hunger. Not the one who comes to me looking for uh, food, uh, looking for miracles, the, the feeding of the 5,000, uh, but the one who comes to Christ as his source will never hunger. And the one who believes in me will never thirst. So these descript descriptors, these ways of describing true saving faith are in contrast to, for example, in John chapter 8, um, there are people who believed in him, Aristens, and by the end of the chapter, they're picking up stones to stone him because when he presses upon them the claims of who he is, they rebel against that because they've, they've seen, they're impressed by his words, they're impressed by his miracles, they're impressed by something, but they're not looking to him as the bread of life. That okay. You want to comment yeah. on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, what I, everything I just said applies. So he said, air is tense. It just doesn't matter. Um, it's it's inconsequential because it's just a way of conceptualizing an action. The aorist tense does not uh, connote false faith um, as some sort of cipher in the Gospel of John. That's just not true. Uh, at the same time, he is pointing to concepts that are important coming to Jesus, like eating. Um, like there's like all these different concepts that are important to understand in the Gospel of John for their different symbols, ways of viewing. Uh, images of of coming to Jesus and finding life in Jesus. So that's true. The forms, like the grammatical forms that they're present participles there, um, all that's doing is saying that this is just a present reality. Um, mm. that, that That's really it. It's just saying the one who is believing, someone who is currently believing, the one who is looking, the one who is currently looking. Um, that's all it's really getting at. Um, and so, yeah, there's no cipher, again, a code between... Right true belief, false belief. Um, if someone is currently believing, then they're currently believing, right? <laughs> and remember when we right. talked about aspect and uh, how these actions are conceptualized. So the, per the present is going to be this imperfective, you're in it, it's currently happening. Right. Right? And, and, see, um, on, and, and on the theological side, of course, you, you hit the gram grammatical side or the semantic side, talking about what the words mean or don't mean. But on the theological side, I would immediately say, okay, uh, let's look at those who belong to God. Dr. White believes they belong to God because they were unconditionally chosen before they were ever born and effectually graced, caused to believe in God through some effectual inward working. I believe that they are responding in faith freely and they could have done otherwise. In other words, by default versus their fault, which is when the debate kind of the contrast. So he believes it's by default that they can't believe and therefore they're not believing. They're not true believers because they have uh, rejected God because God ultimately first rejected them. They, they were born unable to believe. And I don't believe that. And there's nothing in the grammar that supports one interpretation over the other. That's all interpretive. That's all theologically driven, not grammatically or semantically driven, which is why Joel's here to point that out. And and I'd say I don't have the authority yeah. to say it. Yeah, grammatically. Yeah, not gramma right. It's not grammatically determined. There's no nothing, I think, in the grammar that's really going to get you there. Um, and in the, in the, especially in the conversations, at least that we're talking about right now, I should say, um, uh, semantically what words mean that is a bit more important. 
um, that is important. Um, and I mean, I think we'll get there in a minute talking a little bit about the uh, learning and or, or the yeah, hearing from the father and learning. So I'll, I'll save that semantic analysis yeah. of those okay. for, for, for then. Um, yeah, maybe we can continue then. Yeah. Um, and, and just so you know, the starred, uh, the super chats are being starred. Thank you for those that are giving those. And uh, toward the end there, I will uh, address those questions and comments that come in. So thank you all for giving. Then takes us to verse 37. And this was not uh, really a disputed section on a Thursday night because what the provisionists do is they say, this is all true. <clears throat> but they introduce a presupposition as to who the father gives the son. So verse 37 says, all that the father gives me will come to me. And so by going, by jumping down to verse 45 and reading that text, that's why it became the central aspect of the, of the debate by jumping down to 45 and you know, Norman Geiser did that by jumping down to verse 40, but jumping out of the order of discussion. So leaving Jesus's sermon, his talk and you know sort of in a sense saying we, we don't need to follow jesus's order of things um we, we're wiser uh they jump down to verse 45 uh think that there are people who have the capacity in and of themselves to uh hear and learn from the father they then come to the father by their own free will and when they come to the father they're the ones given by the father to the son so you go back up to verse 37 so all that the father gives me will come to me. And okay. Yeah. 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 This is, this is, this is interesting. I mean, he's basically saying that because John six thirty seven comes earlier than later than 45 and 44, that um, you don't want to read those verses back into John six thirty seven, 37 um, stating that Jesus has a specific order. Um, and so you need to follow this like, some sort of sequentially or something like that. I, I'm not qu quite sure that works fully. Um, and I think even before we, we would need to consider that, okay, well, what comes before John 6, 37? Um, and who is Jesus speaking to in this text and in the previous text? So in, in John um, 5, 518, actually, it specifically mentions that it's the Jews to who Jesus is speaking to. And so that sets up the discourse in chapter five for who is being, who is receiving the message. And so there's actually continuity then because in John six, six forty one again, it says that it's the Jews. And so um, leaving aside the whole question, uh, this is totally tangential, but, uh, of, of the, the Jews and John and them as a group. And, and there's a whole dis the scholarly debate on discussion about, about that. I would point you to actually my colleague, Jonathan Numata, who did his dissertation on that. Um, besides that, that group, uh, how we think about that group um, and the depiction of that group. Uh, this, this, the, both of these dialogues in five and six are to the same group. They're called the Jews, they're called the crowd. But so you really do need to be able to go all the way back to five Mm -hmm. to understand what's going on here. This is not, they're not separate. Just because the events occur at different places, it's still the same crowd and it's the same flow of, of narrative and thought and ideas. And John is very much uh, about um, saying one thing and then saying it again in another way and saying another thing and using these kind of ma a matrix of ideas and symbols to uh, paint the same or paint a similar picture. And so he'll return to things. He'll say something another way. Um, I actually brought a quote here um, from a, a recent monograph from 2014. This is from Akala, the son-father relationship. Um, and so this person's written on um, the father, father and the son language and how the, they interact in the Gospel of John, because that's actually really important to what's going on here with the language of giving. The, why is the father giving to the son? James will argue, oh, why can they come to the father? but not to the son that, so they have free will for one, but not for the other. Uh, and that's misunderstanding um, the characterization that John is giving when it comes to um, the father and son relationship in the gospel, where he is trying to say that you cannot separate relationship with God from relationship with Jesus. 
Yes. If you go, if you have a relationship with the father, you will go to the son. If you have a relationship with the son, only because the father has brought you there. There is no distinction. You cannot yeah. honor the, the, the son without the father or the father without the son. And like, that's the whole point of many of these discourses. And so um, w- when it comes to this um, circular matrix of ideas, Akala says, says this. The semantic, so it's some of it scholarly, so just keep, keep your brain on. The semantic analysis that, that, that Akala did provides data for the character analysis of the son and father whose characterization develops simultaneously in the gospel narrative through the emergence and expansion of Johannine symbols. Now, hear this. The son-father characterization is cumulative as each sequential episode reveals or reiterates reiterates dimensions of the relationship through new or prior symbolism. And so what Akala is saying there is that you're going to find reiteration. You're going to find something being said again. And then that idea gets connected to the earlier idea and then something else from before. And they're all, it's just, it's this connected web of ideas in John. That's how John writes. And mm-hmm. specifically how John talks about this a relationship between the son and the father, which is very much the topic of what we're dealing with, what we're dealing with here. And so you'll find things and Leighton, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to just preach to the choir here with you, but you have things earlier than what James is citing here. So not chapter six, all the way back in chapter five, you've got definitions of uh, of the of the Jews in these in in these contexts. So you have you do not have His Word residing in yourselves. That's in verse thirty eight. Mm-hmm. You do not have the love of God in yourselves. That's in verse uh, I believe forty. Might, that might be wrong. I might have a, the wrong verse there. Uh, another one uh, in five twenty three. The one who does not honor the Son does not uh, honor the Father who sent him. Uh, you have another one uh, in 42. They say, we have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. So again, you don't have the love of God in yourselves. You don't have my word in you. It's all these are the same things being spoken of in different ways. Uh, then you hop over to John. Uh, here's John 8, 41, uh, 44. You are of the father, your devil, and you do the desires of your father. So again, this idea that God is not your father. Uh, again, in chapter 847, the one who is from God listens to the words of God. Because of this, you do not listen because you are not of God. God's not your father. You don't have the love of God. Like These are all the same ideas. And then you have again in, uh, make sure I get it right, 854 to 55, the one who glorifies me is my father about whom you say, he's our God and you have not known him. And so not knowing him, don't have the love of father in you. Uh, don't have the word of the father in you. Your father is the devil. Like these are all um, ideas that are um, in a matrix of ideas that are connected together and mutually interpretive, similarly with the father and the son. And so um, the father and the son will be doing things together. They, they work together. Um, judgment is not the father's has been handed to the son, all these things. So John is trying to establish, you cannot distinguish between um, loving God and loving the son. If you love God, if you have the word of God in you, if you're not, the father is not the devil, you will come to the son. That's mm-hmm. what he's trying to establish in the rhetoric and in the um, literary purposes of his gospel. And so when it says, um, yeah, in 637, uh, all whom uh, he's given, the father is given to me uh, will come to me. Yes, because you cannot separate the father and the son's actions. If you if, if you have a relationship with the father, you go to the son. And so you can imagine uh, that a Jewish person, person at the time, or the time of the gospel, the, the gospel of John was written. Uh, okay, you you can't claim to have a relationship to the Father without the Son, because you will go to the Son. That is how it works. And so um, I know you said in the debate you had some ideas about oh you thought that was like kind of historically located um, at the time when Jesus was speaking. I don't think I would follow you there. I think this is always true. And so anytime anyone says. Um, according to the Gospel of John, that is, um, that you have a relationship with God, the Father, then he would say that you will go to the Son. You can't distinguish. He will, you will always be put right. to the, pushed towards and, the and Son. And I wasn't real clear on that one. I, I think that what I was trying to get to is the actual the process of drawing uh, mm-hmm. in the sense that, that 
like Hebrews 1, 1 and 2 says that in the times of old, the father spoke through the prophets. Now he speaks through his son. So it's still the father in both situations. It's the father's means by which he communicates through the prophets and the law, the old covenant versus the new. And so that's what I was trying to reflect on the shifting of those in the new covenant um, are being revealed through the son. And that's not different than the father. It's just a means through which the father is communicating is through his son and obviously the apostles who reflect on his words and his teachings. And so again, in a debate, that's, this is the downside of a debate is that you're, you're in a rush. It's, it's on the spot and you're trying to answer something quickly. And so being able to, to lay it all out, like when he said, just consider if verse 45 comes after verse 44. And I wanted to say, well, consider if chapter six comes after chapter five, because I've already established this point. I, he kept saying, you're starting with verse 45 and reading this concept back into verse 37. I'm like, just like you said, no, I'm not. This concept has been developed well before we even get to chapter six. And that is those who refuse to listen to the father will not come to the son and, and him rebuking them. You refuse to come to me that you may have life. If you listen to Moses, you would listen to me. In other words, if you listen to the prophets, you would listen to me. Um, that's established in a pattern that's repeated, like you said, over and over and over again, which I try to emphasize in the limited amount of time that I had in a debate and try to reemphasize when I was being pushed on this point. Um, and, and so th that that's as clear as I know how to make it. And that's why I think it's starting to resonate somewhat with some people who are grappling with these issues, trying to understand them in context, because when you really put the two side by side, one person has God, um, drawing to himself those who followed him faithfully, which just makes rational sense. It's intuitive. It, there's no mystical anything there. There's no questions. There's no controversy. There's no infant damnation issues or unconditional election issues or any of those kinds of things that come from the debate that Calvinism creates. It, it's all intuitive and basic understanding and flow, in my estimation. Over here, you've got a guy who's unilaterally, you know, where, where ultimately Jesus is introducing to an audience in the first century. God unilaterally picked people before they're ever born and irresistibly causes them to believe in him. Otherwise, they are born unable to do so. By default, they can't believe. And, and it creates all these questions of God's love and longing and desire. It creates issues with culpability, human culpability. Why are they held guilty? Which is what I was trying to get to in the questions about Rob the reprobate. Why is he guilty if he can't help it? If he's born a reprobate, if he's born unable, that's what I'm trying, that, that is the Achilles heel of the entire Calvinistic system is unconditional election slash reprobation. The implication of unconditional election is reprobation. W why do you think Jesus is teaching this to a crowd of grumbling Israelites. I, I explain yourself why you believe that. That's what I'm trying to get Dr. White and other Calvinists just to kind of, because for me coming out of Calvinism, it was kind of that, finally that shock hit me. Is this really what Jesus is teaching in this chapter? Is he just interjecting this Calvinistic concept? And so what I was trying to ask Dr. White when he kept trying to you know, get out from underneath my questions by saying, well, I don't think he's teaching Tulip. He's teaching, you know, well-established biblical doctrine. Okay. Okay. You're nitpicking my question. Uh, and I couldn't get him to get a straight answer, which m some of my frustration may have come through because of that. But when, when you only have a short amount of time and you're trying to get somebody to just acknowledge what they think is happening in the text and they keep running from their previously stated uh, views, like Dr. White does when he tries to say that drawing does not involve regeneration and when in his book, he actually says that, yeah, it gets frustrating and, and, and you're limited. And then you got a moderator who's protecting the guy from answering the hard questions. Yeah, there is some frustration that can happen in those kinds of settings. And you don't know Greek like I don't, and the other guy does. And so he's appealing to Greek as if it's proving his point when I know deep down it's not, uh, though I don't know how to state my case in a given you know situation like that. So yeah, there's some frustration there as well. But that's why I think this is valuable to be able to have, you know, time to talk through it with somebody who knows what they're talking about with regard to the languages. But with that said, let, let's, let's continue on with the next clip here. Yeah, sure. Just as in verse 44, we really didn't get a clear answer as to how it is that someone can have the libertarian freedom to come to the Father without any kind of uh, special grace being given to them. But they don't have the libertarian freedom to come to the Son. So just, I, I, just let, for let the record, me, that's what I just explained, right? Yeah. That's yeah. I, I don't understand that. I, what are you talking about? Nobody can go come unless they're drawn. 
How does he draw? Through his teaching, revelation. You can't come to the Father unless he teaches you, he reveals himself, which he does through the law and the prophets. Mm -hmm. And so I answered that in the debate. I've answered it since then. I wrote it in my book. It's been on every broadcast I've ever done about it. So why, why this is a mystery to him, I have no idea. You need the same thing to come to the Father that you need to come to the Son. You need revelation. You need light. You need the Word. You need the truth. You need God to reach he, out to you. Yeah, you need exactly. grace. Exactly. Yeah. You need yeah God's grace that comes through revelation, through light, through yeah. truth. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's the same coming to the Father as coming to the Son, which he asked that question in the debate. I answered that question in the debate. So why he's on a broadcast now saying, I still don't know Layton's answer to this question. We never got an answer to it. Again, as you said before, it's demonstrably untrue. It's a de That's demonstrably false. All right, moving on. Um, I don't understand that. And maybe the explanation, I, I suppose the explanation that would be given here is that they had to be hardened to bring about the crucifixion. And since crucifixion is now taking place, but then again, John 12 was also before the crucifixion, but they would say, well, when I am lifted up, then I will draw all men to myself. So that's why I asked at the beginning, are these verses still relevant today? And I, he said, yes, but I think the answer is actually no. Um, because it was, and I'm, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure this out from their perspective and piecing together things that Flowers said. It seems like what they're saying. Why he's acting like he's never heard this? Michael Brown, who he's a friend of and debated on the subject, argued the same points that I'm arguing. Steve Gregg argued the same points I'm arguing. There's some different nuances and different views, mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, they argued that it's the lost sons of Israel. It's the people who believed in him. Um, previously, uh, Jewish people who were followers of the Father who'd been drawn. I mean, all of them made those same arguments. So he's acting like he's just now figuring this out, like he's just now grappling with this this new found view. It, mm -hmm. At least that's the way he talks about it. And that that's what's baffling to me is that he's not familiar with this very well established perspective that even he's debated before a, a few and times. I think you could even, yeah, dehistoricize, not in the sense of making it unhistorical, um, but just that like, you could bring the theology, just like I was saying, um, not so much just that it's about Israelites at the time of Jesus who, who listened to the Father, but it's just at all times, if you have a relationship with the Father, if you, like, you can't separate the Father from the Son. If you if you find God the Father, I you will go to saying. the Son. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like that the that's the theology being yeah. taught. You cannot separate the two, and that's a very um, core theological tenet in the Gospel of John that the Father and the Son are one. You don't right. get one without the other, right? Well, you got and Rahab, so we, for example, who's obviously not an Israelite, and that would be true of her as well. Um, and so, yeah, generally speaking, yeah, it would be applicable to all all tribes, all peoples. Um, I guess the reason I'm, I'm refer referencing to Israel is, is what you said earlier, is that he's speaking to the Jews mm -hmm. at that time, at least. And so in that context is is kind of what we're talking about. But all yep. right, we're, uh, just to be able to have time to get through this, let's go into the next. Yep. Is that at that time, because of judicial hardening to bring about the crucifixion, the only way you could come to Jesus was if you had already come to the Father, and then he would give you to Jesus. But that's not the case anymore. Because Jesus is now drawing people to himself directly without all the rest of this stuff having to happen. So it just it just seems to me that John 6 just doesn't really matter any longer. Okay. Okay. One, let me just address that real quick before I let you jump in on it if you want to. Um, even I even play a clip of John MacArthur in my pre-debate stuff on my in my book. I, I cite John MacArthur who goes through the pur purpose of the parables, why why the, he's using parables. I, I uh, Gabe Hughes, who I debated on John 6 before, actually references as well the use of parables uh, to, to keep Israel in the dark, hardening them in their unbelief in order to bring about the crucifixion. Just like he, he hardened Pharaoh to bring about the first Passover, he's hardening Israel to bring about the second Passover. Um, even Piper, MacArthur, even leading Calvinistic scholars acknowledge the, the messianic secret, the use of uh, of hardening or sending a spirit of stupor to Israel. Dr. White doesn't even address, he, he makes it sound like those that particular issue is not even relevant or it doesn't even address how it's relevant in his, in his own interpretation. And so I can cite from his own camp, so to speak, like you did with D.R. Carson, to, to establish this is just a truism. This is just a, a biblical doctrine now, you may interpret it differently or apply it differently in your theology, but just pretending as if it doesn't exist isn't an answer. And that's, again, something that I find frustrating with the way in which Dr. White is engaged with our particular perspective. Anyway, did you want to comment any more on that before going to the next clip? 
not really except i'd love to talk about romans 9 sometimes or sometimes <laughs> that would be fun that would be a fun I, i'll have to have you back uh, for that discussion that'll be fun all right uh everyone who sees the sun now, this is not just a glancing <clears throat> again this is a present participle it is a substantival participle so the looking one the one who is looking in opposition to the one who just glances the one who just believes for a, mo a moment um because the next one is pistuon and believes in him and again substantival participle the article before their own is functioning with pistuon <coughs> so everyone looking everyone believing true saving faith is an ongoing thing it is not a mere glance it is not a mere tipping of the hat the um three words all right you want to comment on that uh, just that, like, yes, what I already said about the present participle, it's describing something that is currently happening. Uh, reading, like, it, it, that he's trying to get you to think, like, oh, it's not a glance, or it's not like the aorist, or something like that. Like, that's just kind of over-reading basic kind of forms. I think that the point is someone who is presently believing, someone who is presently looking. That's just the point. And um, verbal aspect, like the way that, uh, again, uh, the action is conceptualized, uh, can often be uh, muted in in certain forms and in certain constructions, and um, even in the one that he was just looking at with pass before it, uh, pass, uh, and then the article, and then the present participle. Oftentimes, that the, the kind of iterative or the um, imperfective aspect can be kind of muted in those instances. I'm not making the claim necessarily for that one. I'd have to do more work on that. Um, but even still, that that's something that should be known because there are other cases for sure where you're, it's not really focusing on the, the the present tense or anything like that. And so there, there's more to it than just that. Okay. All right. Yeah. Moving on to the next, next section here. Contest deductoi you. <clears throat> so this is the genitive of, of agency. Um, the, the agency by which someone becomes taught is by God. God is the one doing the teaching here. So this, Jesus is taking this text from either Isaiah 54 or Jeremiah 31, both of which, go read them, beautiful passages. You should know the Jeremiah 31 one. That's the New Covenant text, Hebrews 8. We've gone through that rather thoroughly on the last road trip, uh, responding uh, to our friends up in Moscow. On the, That was right after Reformation Day, remember? <coughs> Excuse me, man, like I said, either the bronchitis is coming back and I'm dying of something else, or it's just simply, you know, I've got the windows open and... <laughs> I haven't taken uh, any any histamines uh, since since yesterday. Um, both passages, Isaiah fifty four, Jeremiah thirty one, are about the new covenant and the finished and completed redemptive work of Christ. And so the the people that are in view, this teaching that is being done by God, is not the teaching of the whole world. It's of a specific people, just as the drawing of verse forty four was of a specific people. And so what you have in verse 45 is Jesus's biblical commentary saying, see, in the prophets, we already had a reference to the fact that God would be the one making learners. That's what didactoi. It's, it's an adjective, but it's functioning uh, substantively. So they are taught, they are, they are the learners of God, and the means by which this is happening is God. God's in the genitive, and... There's, you, you can use uh, the, the dative to talk about instrument, means by which something happens. But when there is a special personal element to that, very frequently, the genitive will be utilized. That's what's used here. Okay. Yeah. You want to comment on that? Yeah. Well, that last thing about a special personal element with the genitive, I would really want to see a citation on that. Um, that's, again, strikes me as a, just kind of something he's saying. Um, I have never encountered that. Uh, I am willing to be wrong that somehow in the nuances of Greek um, diction that the the genitive was more personal, but that just seems to be, again, a complete stretch to me. Um, that's really not how it's just, it's just of genitive just means like, like the cup oh, of God. Joel, um, the uh, love of God, the, uh, it's, a, it's just one term being in relation to another term and then how that of is functioning um is the question and so he's here uh, he said it was ablative a uh, in his uh, in the debate um and he, uh, here he's saying it's it's like a source or by means of and that's true that's actually true it is saying taught 
by God. And he uses a bunch of, he talks about grammar. He says, oh, it's a substantive rather than, than an adjective. Like that's fine, but that's meaningless. There's no reason to say those things really. I mean, they're true. Um, and even when he says that he says taught by God, um, I mean, I don't know if he does it in this specific clip, but I th in the debate, it seemed that he was leaning towards that somehow that talk that is um, then inferring that volition is on God's part only, uh, or that um, that this is like some sort of effectual um, thing, like because of the grammar that is because, but there's right. nothing in the grammar. It just, it just means that God taught God gave a lesson. That's all. That's all the grammar establishes. To go beyond that, we have to get to other categories and think other ways. But yeah, the grammar doesn't help. Yeah, that's and that's what I was trying to get to because I, for even from a person who knows English, you can get that f all from English. Yep. Grammar. I mean, in other words, and I, and I knew that well enough because my the, my Greek friends are telling me, Leighton, it's the same in English as in Greek as far as your particular interpretive you know aspects are. The difference is because he's you're still talking about those belonging to God. The question is, why do they belong to God? Mm -hmm. And that's that's a, that's a totally separate question from what you see in in the gr grammatical constructs. Because why they belong to God is either because they have freely listen and learn from what he's teaching or they were unconditionally chosen before the foundation of the world and some kind of miraculously caused to believe which is what dr white is assuming upon the text this, when i keep saying presuppositions i really mean it he he has a presupposition he has a commitment to calvinism tulip prior to coming to this text and he's reading that the, those belonging to god he's reading into that they belong to god because they were unconditionally picked Unconditional election is being assumed, not established. I established why I believe the condition was their faith prior uh, to to being drawn to Jesus. In other words, G God the Father is drawing to Jesus those who believe in Him and follow Him, believe and follow, belong to Him already. Those who have the love of God, those who have His Word dwelling right. in, like those that list I already gave you. Yeah, from right. before, I established context. that. Yeah. I established that throughout the context where they said I'm jumping around and all that stuff and it has nothing to do with John 6. I'm just rolling my eyes. I'm establishing the point of contention by showing the con by showing the condition these people did not meet versus the people who did meet the, this condition. Um, you know, and, and and I'm establishing that by letting scripture interpret scripture, which is what you're supposed to do with exegesis. Dr. White never establishes unconditional election ever. He mm -hmm. just assumes it and then and then appeals to Greek nuances as if they prove his point and because i'm not fluent in greek i can't on the spot challenge his claims and that's where some of the frustration came out because i knew better but at the same time i don't know how to correct him on the spot because i don't know the languages and so joel's here to do that today so <laughs> thanks for that all right moving on <laughs> yeah Let's so where have we heard that before all the father gives me comes to me the one looking the one believing comes to me, raise them up in the last day. And from this group that is defined by Jesus, all will be taught by God. These are those that are drawn. That's the group, just as you had up in verse um, 38 and 39. You had this group as a group. I will lose none of it. Here you have the same group. This is consistent reading all the way through. You're starting up here. You're going down here. You're not jumping around. You're allowing the terms to define themselves in the context without turning things upside down, sideways, whatever you're trying to do. Once people do that, you know that's the indication of their traditions. It shall all be taught of God, everyone hearing para to patras, hearing from the Father. So if you, if you are the recipient of this divine action on the part of God, you're part of that all that is being made to learn by God. You are hearing from the Father. That's what it means to be drawn. All right. You want to comment on that? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the point you were talking about earlier, right? That the all and the everyone, um, you think you could have conceded that point, And you could have. And I think they are referring to the same group. Basic kind of communication um, would push towards that if you say all in one group without a distinction and then all again immediately after that you're going to be assuming the same thing um we disambiguate these things in our minds and so we assume that what the person's saying is there's a continuity um so that's one thing like just on a language level like a linguistic level but uh, at the same time what i pointed out to you in the debate with the debate review with zach is that uh, he's citing from isaiah 54 
And in that context, it's a eschatological um, vision of, of kind of everything being right and good. And so those who are taught in that context, it's not as though it's like all of Israel and some may or may not. In that context, it's everyone actually is in um, saving relationship with Yahweh, in, in, in peace, it says, in the, in the, the parallel to, um, line to that line, that all your children will be in peace. And so it's 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 a positive statement. And so in that sense, he he White is right here, and I think that rightly um, you should have conceded that to him. Uh, that he, those who are taught are are those who everyone who 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 uh, hears and learns from the listen Father, and learn. right? Yeah, listen and learn. Because because if he's speaking about those who belong to God, uh, children of God, in other words, followers of the Father, um, they they the followers of the Father will be taught by God that everyone who listens and learns the same group will come to Jesus. Um, and there's no reason to even debate that point because it's, uh, it's, it's the question is whether or not they're in that group unconditionally or conditionally, unconditionally, meaning they were chosen before they were born, created to become believers by some work of miraculous work of God, or they freely, uh, listen and learn from the father. And, and and reverses uh, versus uh, refusing to listen and learn, which obviously people can do. And so, um, so I wish I'd have just known that, or just had already adopted that view, so I wouldn't have had to debate that point. I could have just conceded that point and said it still doesn't prove conditionality, it, because it doesn't even address conditionality. And in mm -hmm. that way, it could have we could have honed in on that particular point and not been distracted by him asking the same question over and over and over again that I felt I'd already adequately addressed, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. that that's why we're doing this. So we can clarify and understand truth better. So well, well said. Mm -hmm. For right. this reason, I said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the father. He was saying elegant. Elegant is the imperfect. Oh, so we're actually, I think we've moved down now. So just, just stop for a sec there. Uh, yeah. This is a new clip. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So I'll just quickly comment before we hop to this here, because I think this is the last one um, of yeah. this this broadcast. Is that right? Okay. I think yeah. so. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, just previously, um, just on the idea of listening and learning, uh, it's it, he didn't address it here, but in the debate, uh, he he did. He he emphasized that listening and learning are passive actions on the part of the um, person doing them. So you're just intaking something. You're listening. You're bringing teaching in. And um, I, I don't know if that necessarily stands. Um, he'd have to make that case. And so what I did in the review with Zach was I pointed out just kind of, if you go to a lexicon, uh, which is just a, a fancy term for a dictionary, the scholars use, um, and you can actually find John 6, 45 linked to uh, a, a text, I think it was Poly in Polybius, or is it Plutarch? No, I'm, I'm forgetting, that's fine. Uh, again, we make mistakes, uh, but it doesn't matter. You can find it in BDEG. Um, and it, essentially, you can see that the, the author starts talking about the idea of how listening is actually different from learning and that learning involves much more on the part of the person. And so Greeks conceptualized uh, when they thought about listening and learning, they thought, at least he did, this author, that um, that it's actually a much more uh, engaging thing, a much more um, thing that involved on the part of the learner. And so you can't just assume that these are passive actions. You have to go into the, the, the to Greek literature at the time, New Testament, outside of the New Testament, and how did people conceptualize these ideas of learning? Was learning an active thing? Was it not? And so you can't assume that. You have to actually go into the literature and, and try and figure that out. That's a lot of work. That's a ton of work. Um, I only just started and lo started looking at that. Um, and yeah, it, it already seems just from looking at the first, or I mean, uh, the the first resource people would typically look at, which is BDAG. Um, yeah, it, it, it didn't seem to hold. So yeah, uh, it, he needs to prove that if he's going to make that point. It does really seem like uh, those taught of God is being further defined as those who listen and engage. They learn. They try. They learn from the right, Father. Right. Yeah. Yeah, um, that makes so more sense. Further definition of that, of that point. Uh, yeah, we can move to the next clip if you want, but I see you've taken it down. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, I was going to pull up because you you might think that after hearing your correction that he was willing to kind of back down, but he actually did another broadcast after, I guess, hearing a portion of your correction. I'm not sure, but in his late, he, yeah, well, I don't know if he listened to yours or not, but apparently yesterday he did another broadcast talking about it again, and uh, and he says this, so let's just kind of watch it 
and you can comment on it as well if you'd like. Here we go. And in passing during the debate, the present tense participles, the one seeing, um, the, the one looking, the one believing, the one coming, when I pointed that out, that was one of the things that this Septuagint scholar guy That's you. Uh, took uh, took difference with. I guess he'd take difference with Bob Gagnon too. <laughs> Don't know, but but reformed exegetes have recognized and emphasized the fact that in John, saving faith is present tense. It's ongoing in contrast to aorist and pluperfect. I think that I don't care how strongly you try to do the unless the context pushes it. The context is pushing right, didn't we? in regard. Yeah, well, that that's not actually we didn't see that one. Um, oh, we that, that's oh. that's yeah, that's a restatement of what he said oh. earlier. And we already went over it and you yeah. already demonstrated that it wasn't true. But he's yeah. doubling down and saying it's just a given. Uh, I wonder that, if he's seen any of my, my, I don't know. I don't know if he's watched anything uh, that, that I've, I've said about this, to be honest. Um, yeah. I, I really would be interested to see how he responds to uh, to me and to D.A. Carson, for that matter. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, did we have one more clip left? Yeah, let, let's, wanna... uh, yeah, let's um, go. Lego. And that refers to a continuous action in the past. In this case... It doesn't have to be continuous. There's different kinds of imperfects, but I think this was called an iterative imperfect. He was repeatedly saying to them, he was saying, for this reason, I have said to you, no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Okay. Yeah. Now, because, uh, yeah, there is says, one more clip. As a here, result keep of this, Ectu do you want to do you want to comment on that? Yeah, we'll talk comment on the whole thing. This is done. Yeah. All right. Most of the time, you know, most interpreters have missed that and have said, well, uh, you know, the disciples they 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 didn't. They, they went back. They had already said these are hard words. Um, but Ek Tuta, when, when you have this verse, and he was saying, for this reason, I've said to you, no one is able to come to me unless it has been granted to him for the Father. For this reason, many of his disciples went away. They stopped following him. Because he kept emphasizing John 6, 44 and John 6, 65. And people find that offensive. And that's why provisionists find it offensive even to this day. They are offended by the very same thing that caused the disciples to walk away. That emphasis, which they clearly saw, had nothing to do with their controlling God the Father's choices by their own choices. But in yeah, and he, this is something he repeats all the time, where he'll talk about how if you're offended by Paul in Romans nine, it's because you're a synergist, and that's who he's responding to as a synergist in the first century. And the same is true here: you're offended by his Calvinism. Um, when the, the truth of the matter is the people were offended because he said he's from heaven and, and they're not true followers. They're superficial followers. They're trying to fill their bellies. They're there for physical uh, needs, not spiritual needs. And they're walking away because of that, not because God rejected them before they were born and they were created by default, unable to believe the gospel. And God's just pointing that out to them through Jesus. He's just, you know, introducing Calvinistic sociology to them. And that's why they're getting mad. Um, that that's absolutely blatantly absurd in my opinion, but I, well, I may have I stole your thunder on that the, one, but no, well, I'll play the advocate here. I'll play the, the devil's advocate and say, uh, if I'm white, I'll say to you, you're not reading the Greek text, Layton, because it says from this, ek, uh, now he said ek tuta, it's not ek tuta, it's ek tutu. Um, and I think he said ek tutan as well. Um, but in, in any case, that's just a slip of the tongue. That's fine. Uh, but so John six sixty six, we see right there, uh, those two words right there on the side, um, that you know, if you don't know Greek, it's, it's fine. It, it just says from this, and so he's saying from this refers to the statement uh, that um, no one is able to come to me if, if the, it's not been given to him uh, from the Father. Now that could be the case, however, um, that that's not necessarily the case because from this could also be a discourse marker that, that that points you to the entire discourse that came before, which is what kind of you were saying. Um, so he's assuming that the from this must point to what immediately precedes, whereas that does that is not necessarily the case. So you could easily you could also trace the this. So what this is it talking about? It's possible that you could go from this, then you have to go back down to 665, 
And, and he was saying, on account of this, I said to you, so there's the this again, and you even go back and it goes back to the hard saying, which is this whole discourse on he's the bread of life. Um, you, you have to come to him as the bread. And there's a lot of things in that discourse that are really tough for these people because one, like you said, they want to fill their bellies. But it also says earlier, they want to make him king. It's Passover. Passover is yep, coming. Yep. Liberate us. We want to be liberated. Yet Jesus is saying, Moses gave you bread and an exodus. I'm giving you a different one. I'm giving you something that, that, that you're not expecting. And what do they do? They grumble. It's the same term used in the Septuagint version uh, of the Greek version of the Old Testament, Ganguzo. And so there's direct connections here to the wilderness wandering stories. Uh, stories. And so what it's, 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 he's establishing is that you are just like the Israelites in the wilderness who grumbled because you didn't like the provision that God was giving you. You, you want it to be a different way. And the way you want it is you want me to make king, you want me to make me king. You want me to give you bread. We, you want these things. And also, I would add, why is it a hard saying? It's a hard saying because he just said you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, if you're a Jew in the first century, that goes against ritual law. That goes against the ways, uh, what clean and unclean laws. So he's actually provided an image of drinking the blood, which you can't do according to the, to the Torah. Uh, he's provided an image that is very hard to for them to, to get or to even get on board with because he's in essence saying you have to do things different than the Torah. You have to we're doing something new. We're moving beyond just the the Mosaic Torah here. I am a new Moses. Uh, the bread that Moses gave you, you died. I'm giving you something new beyond Moses. And so he's very much redefining Torah and Torah observance and what it means to be a faithful follower of God in the present era. And so all yeah. of that contributes to why it's a hard saying. Um, and so it's not just it's that, oh, from this, because of the Calvinistic, quote unquote, Calvinistic statement, um, that's why people are mad. And, uh, no, I think it's far more because of what had just happened in the entire sum of the discourse, which you can get back to from the Ek Tutu that he's talking about here. And so... Um, I don't think it, it, it's him saying because of this um, one statement in 665, rather it's pointing to the entirety of the discourse that just came. And that's a perfectly right. legitimate interpretation. Um, and I, I think right. probably I, makes far more sense given the, yeah. the flow of the narrative. Yeah. Yeah, and, and also grammatically speaking, syntactically speaking, that is 100% fine. Um, so right. just because he's that's, against that's Greek. usually the way I hear scholars talk about that is usually they, they say it the way you just did that grammatically can be taken. The interpretation or the, the theological interpretation can be taken this way or this way within the range of what the grammar would allow. And that's the way I typically hear, you know, linguistic scholars speak when I listen to them. Dr. White tends to be more dogmatic and say, this is the only way the Greek can be taken the way that I have interpreted it. And he's really he doubles down on the dogmatism and, and saying, this is the, really the only interpretive way of taking it, um, which I think undermines his case. It doesn't strengthen his case. I think it undermines it because those like yourself who know the languages, you know, see through that and know better. Now the masses of audience that don't know Greek may just take his word for it because they don't know the languages. And I, and I think that the, he's actually hurting his case because the more and more people like ourselves that get out there and start talking, the more and more uh, people will stop following him because they won't see him as a good faith interlocutor like a D.A. Carson might be because he's willing to be intellectually honest enough just to admit when the grammar doesn't support one interpretation over the other. But I was just going to say verse 64 is one of the strongest supporting my view because it says he knew from the beginning those who did not believe and it's for this reason he told them they can't come because it's not granted to them by the Father. In other words, what reason is he not granting them to come? Because they're not believing. They have not met the condition. If they met the condition of true faith instead of following him for superficial reasons, then he would give them to the Son. But because they're not believing, because he knows they're not believing, that's the reason they're not being given to the Son. And so even if you interpret it, you know, it just reflecting back to 65, if you take that into consideration, it's not a Calvinistic interpretation at all because it's not speaking to the conditionality of being being unconditional choice of people before the foundation of the world being caused to believe. Again, that's all being theologically packed into those verses eisegetically on our estimation and, and not supported by the, by the text. There is a little bit more. Do you want to listen to this last little section? 
just before, just before we do, yeah, that was a really good explanation, and I think that's a totally viable interpretation of this text. And yeah, I I would I think that was, that was really well spoken. Uh, I I think you could also take the on um, and he was saying on account of this the, this to refer back to the hard the hard saying as well, which is kind of more in the line what I was saying. But honestly, they're both viable options, and like you said, you need to be able to admit when there are viable options in, um, yes. for for interpretation. And when you there's nothing really in the Greek that's going to get you there, you're going to you have to do more considerations or say, could be this, could be that on this one. We have to go elsewhere. Yeah, well, well said. All right, let's listen to the last little Seth, clip. Jesus was saying, unless the father draws you to me, unless it has been granted to you of the father, you do not have the capacity to come to me. You don't have. It. And that was true then. And what Jesus said about looking to the sun, believing in the sun, all those things are still true today. Okay. And that, that's the end of it. And again, we don't, I don't disagree with any of that. It's just, it's about the conditionality of those being given uh, is the only difference. And so that's, that's where I felt like after I, he got done with his opener, I felt like this. And even the first line of his uh, rebuttal, he makes a statement as if I would disagree with it because he's not hitting on the point of contention with regard to the conditionality. But I, I won't bore you with all of that. I think you've covered what we came here to cover. Um, and and I and I wanted, before I go through the super chats and any of the comments, questions that people may have, I wanted just briefly, I know we've gone a little longer than I had originally planned, but if, if you're okay, I'd like to, to get your story just a little bit. You, you had said that yeah. you were, you affirmed Calvinism. You're a DA Carson fan. You affirmed Calvinism. Uh, t- tell us a little bit about that. What why you were a Calvinist and what kind of led you out. Give us a little sure. synopsis of your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I became a Christian um, in my, in my uh, late teens. Um, I was actually just about, just about 18 years old. Uh, I had a pretty troubled life before that, not to get into all my, my details, but um, I was not a scholar, let's say that. And I didn't have any really good grades, like basically failing in high school um, and uh, had some serious addiction issues with certain substances and things like that. And so uh, I very much met Jesus in that. Uh, and he saved me from that in a really p- uh, powerful way. Um, and so it really transformed my life um, when I was about 18 years old. And so after that, I really had a passion suddenly to understand what the Bible says. And I said, okay, I'm going to figure this out. Uh, this newfound reality has transformed me. And so I want to know and understand this faith and who this Jesus is, who I have apparently met. And so, uh, yeah, uh, after that kind of transformative, really big change in my life where I never went back to any of that, um, and it just never had the desire to, uh, yeah, I started studying the Bible. I went to, I decided to go to Bible college and, uh, right around that time reading my Bible, I had a friend as well, actually one of the friends I met with yesterday morning. And he, uh, he said to me, uh, Hey, read Romans nine. And he had become a Christian, uh, actually just maybe a year before or something like that. And we sat in his room in his house and he read to me Romans 9. And he said, what do you do with that? And I'm like, oh, I hate what that says. Like what I think that says, like that, that sounds harsh. But I mean, if that's the reality of it, like, then like God be praised and like, we'll, we'll go with it. And so, yeah, like I, I read it and I went, okay, Romans 9 must say, that like this is God's choice and not mine, and I had no volition in this. this it's not Him who runs or wills. It's it's God, and who am I to answer back to God? And so uh, yeah, I really started listening to Reformed theologians at that point. I really loved John Piper uh, for many many years. I listened to again listened to everything, read everything. I was very very influenced by John Piper and I discovered D. A. Carson in the process as well. And absolutely loved D.A. Carson, especially his scholarly way of doing things, because that's kind of the way that I um, am inclined is to really get into details. Um, who knows? I don't know why my brain is like this, but it's just like I just hyper fixate on things. And uh, perhaps mm-hmm. it's like ADHD or something. I don't know. My wife jokes about that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I so I just uh, really focused in on uh, uh, reform theology and understanding the text from that perspective, because that's what the text seemed to say to me, especially in texts like John 6, in Romans 9, Ephesians 1, um, other texts as well. And uh, these people were the ones who were training me. So uh, you, you take for granted that they know exactly they know what they're talking about. And yeah. I'm not saying they don't know what they're talking about necessarily, but um, in some regards, they, they have 
presuppositions and assumptions about the text that they've come to and from those who taught them as well. And yeah, I learned from them for a very, very long time. So um, for, for many years, I was in that camp. Uh, I don't know how many, over 10, 10, let's say 10. Um, I've never stopped to do the math. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, so I continued. I did a lot of my education as, as, a, as, a, as a Calvinist. Um, and then it was, uh, let's say, 10 years later. I'm st still a Calvinist, uh, still committed to it, teach it, preach it, tell people about it. If you ask me about it, I'll tell you why Calvinism is correct. Yeah, I know the, the big question is always like, what was the turning point? Like, when, when did the light come on? You and know, I'll was there right something you're, you yeah, what, you're something you're reading? What, what happened? Yeah. Yeah. So this is, this is, this is it. I'll tell you it. Uh, I was sitting in the room above me right now, um, in the morning. It was a living room at that point. Now it's our kids' room. Um, but, uh, yeah, I was sitting there doing a daily morning devotional from Greek because this is what I, again, I'm a very hyper fixated person. So I'm <laughs> always reading Greek. Uh, and, uh, I read I that Romans 9 in my devotional. And so no one, so just, just to be clear, no one was telling me anything otherwise. I was, I, this was just a devotion, a morning devotion. I picked it up. Oh, come on. Sorry. You were watching my video, weren't you? Mm -mm, sorry, buddy. I had never heard of you. <laughs> you read, you read my book. You were <laughs> reading my book. You. I'm sorry. Yeah. And I get to Romans, <laughs> nine, I'm reading Romans nine and I get through it in Greek once and I just stop and I go, wait a second. Wait, what? And I go back and I read it again. I go back and I read it again. I go back and I read it again. Now I start taking the Old Testament citations and I go back to the Old Testament and I start reading them. Oh, just I jumping just, around all over the Bible, aren't you? Just jumping around. Well, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm going to where Paul cites in Romans 9. I go back. You don't to know the his, history. You don't know the history of my the accusations because that's what I did oh. in my debate is I cite the Old Testament passages and he accuses me of just jumping around all over the Bible. Well, that's but what Paul anyway. cites. So. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. It's Paul's citations. You have to yeah. look at Paul's citations. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. And, yeah, I should so, have interrupted um, you. Go ahead. No, it's fine. It's fine. And uh, yeah, I'm reading and I just start going back and I read those full passages passages full like chapters like of context what is going on in this chapter in these chapters in um uh, genesis malachi and um i mean hosea comes a bit later uh you've got exodus um yeah so all these different passages and i kid you not probably three and a half hours later um of just sitting and reading and going back and forth and back and forth i just sat and i went i can't believe it i think i'm wrong I don't think this actually says what I thought it said. I think this is talking about Israel. I think this is talking about um, God, who God, what, by what God is, a, God does not choose things on the basis of biology and he can define Israel in any way he wants to define Israel. And that's his choice and his prerogative. And it's a Jew who is arguing against him going, yes. uh, wait, uh, uh, you, you'll find fault or, or why does he still find fault who can resist his will well it's like if you're a first century jew and suddenly god says oh by the way everything is defined in christ now it's like you changed the rules on me buddy well i can't resist that how, how am i supposed what am i supposed to do about that and it's like you could see um that it's in that it's an inter, the interlocutor the person that he's that's being argued with is an unbelieving jew who's relying on biology Relying Joel, did you and I talk about this before? Did we, no. we plan that we were going to talk about this? No. <laughs> so if y'all, Joel doesn't listen to this, okay, my, my broadcast for no. the most part. I mean, he doesn't even know who I am. Just just note that because anybody who listens to this broadcast, all of you listeners, you've heard me say almost exact verbatim what you just heard from Joel, who came from just reading the original languages himself. Okay. I just, I love hearing people who are smart come to the same conclusion that I had come to long ago, but didn't come through me. Uh, so uh, just, it's just that verification of, yes, we're, we're going the same direction. So keep going. I, I love it. I yeah. love hearing it. Well, I mean, that's just that, that, that was like the turning point. Cause, cause Romans nine got me in and then suddenly I'm going, oh no, like, oh, if Romans do do nine do doesn't now? say this, like, oh no, where's my <laughs> I defense? Need to figure... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what do I do? That's my, that's my entire apologetic for this entire <laughs> worldview. Yeah. And it's gone. And so, yeah. Uh, I mean, I had other texts like Ephesians one. Uh, John six. And uh, I mean, there's lots of other passages you can go to as well and little, little things, but it's just slowly, I started to think about it and go through it. And um, like I said, at the beginning, I, I think I saw maybe one of your videos in, or uh, something in 20, maybe like tw in the, 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 I don't know, 2016, 17, 18, I don't know when, 
Um, like I've probably, I have encountered you in the past, but it's not like you've taught me all these things or anything like yeah, that. Yeah, right, right, right. I never Romans nine. Uh, so I just want to be clear on that. I have heard, I've heard of you, um, but I don't, I don't follow you in that sense. Um, yeah. And so it was really just a slow process at that point going, um, okay, let's reread. Let's ask questions. Let's, let's be as scholarly as we can. And honestly, this, this is the hard part. Um, this is not, they're both hard parts. One hard part is reinterpreting the text and getting out of your presuppositions about what the text says. What could it say otherwise? That's a hard thing to do. The other hard thing to do is socially. All my friends were Calvinists. My mentor was a Calvinist. Um, I had doubled down in Calvinistic theology for 10 plus years. Uh, and now if I'm going to come out and say, I don't think that's right. Like that's an ego hit. That 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 is a really humbling experience. Um, yes. That that brought me to the to the dust to go. Oh my, I have misrepresented God and the Bible, and it was so utterly certain that I had I had it right. Uh, I need to. Uh, I, you basically just need to kind of sit in silence for a while. <laughs> you need to just kind of realize that um, you can be wrong and and sincerely wrong. Um, yeah. And so it was a process. Uh, I eventually told my friends, uh, it was, a, a yeah, this whole coming out thing of, I'm not a Calvinist anymore. And, uh, Were, weren't you kind of uh, dreading, were you kind of dreading that because you, at least for me, if it was, if it was the same for you, I, I remember how I used to think about non-Calvinists as being not all that scholarly or bright. Yeah. And I was just dreading how my friends were going to start viewing me. Did you have that same kind of feeling? Totally. Yeah. Or <laughs> I'm some liberal now. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, okay, Joel, liberal Joel, he's not actually believing the Bible. Like, liberal Joel, he's gone off. And, like, yeah, it's like, there's he's so not many a, social ramifications. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, an just... yeah, it's just like, you, it's just that he's abandoning the, 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 the Bible and he's just making stuff up or whatever, or just doing right, something right. that's it's quote unquote easy or who knows. Um, yeah, and I mean that's just kind of the, the short story uh, of of me coming out, and so it's it's been a, it's been a while now, and um, yeah, I uh, honestly I can say from the other side uh, before actually before I say this, I will emphasize I came out of Calvinism because of the text. I am a text person. Mm -hmm. What does the text say, and how do you know that? Can you be wrong? Is it possible you're wrong? Uh, and it's a hard process to come to terms with being wrong. Um, so yeah. it's a text thing. But I have come to realize, having come out of Calvinism, that um, it was really not the best um, for, for... I found that psychologically, it's it really does do a toll on you. Um, like the idea of like uh, defined determinism um, and people not being saved because God is not allowing them to be saved um, and these kinds of things. Um, it whether you know it or not it does affect you mentally and so i found myself in a much greater state of peace and a much greater yes. state of um happiness and in love of god like i i actually i really can say i love god i love the bible um like i really enjoy what i do and i'm, I'm constantly just um surprised by what i find and yeah. uh new things that i find and old things that become wonderful again and um yeah it's 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 a much better place um, and I think there are probably like psychological things that we could talk about, which we don't, we don't need to right now. And other people have probably yeah, done yeah. that much better than I could. Um, but I do think that it, it can, can, not always, but can create um, some negative psychological associations. Yes. Yeah. And I hear testimony about that quite regularly from people who are former Calvinists and, and others that myself included things that I had grappled with in my own walk because of some of the implications of Calvinism. And it's not necessarily trying to say every Calvinist has the same, you know, uh, problems that I had or everybody's different, obviously. But, um, you know, the last Oxford scholar that I had on was Ken Wilson, uh, was more of a church historian. You're, you're more in the linguistic, uh, field where he was more in the historical field. He's also a, a hand surgeon, uh, orthopedic hand surgeon. So he's a whole different kind of doctor, but he's also, uh, an Oxford graduate. And, and I encouraged him after our talk to, uh, to take his dissertation because he'd written on uh, Augustine's influence on the Christian church and those kinds of things. And I encouraged him to, to put it into layman form, you know, to put his work into layman form. Because, and I'm really glad that he did because that's now accessible to a lot of people who, a lot of people purchase his book now. Um, 
who have access to to work they never had before. And in the same way, I, I kind of feel like I want more people addressing this who have the background and knowledge and scholarship. I, I, I consider myself more of a popularizer of the scholars than a scholar myself, even though Dr. Pritchett, who's who I work with at Trinity, says, stop doing that. You're a scholar in your own right. And I, yeah, well, okay, maybe on certain things. Uh, yeah, okay, whatever. But I, I see myself as more finding the scholars and helping people know more about them. And and so people now know you, Joel, and, and I, I, I love that they know who you are. Um, the 1300 plus people who are watching now know who you are. Um, I want to encourage you to start, you know, not just, obviously I, I'm not, I'm the one string banjo here and nobody can take that banter away from me and so that banner away from me. So that's my, that's my thing. You can't have it, but I would encourage you in, in your studies and in your broadcasts and stuff to at least address this issue. Um, if you haven't already, you know, you may already have stuff out there, but I would love to see more broadcasts from people like you who have, you know, especially linguistic scholarship behind you stating some of the things you're stating on a more regular basis. And so again, I, I, I'm, I'm not God even pretend to be, uh, the, the Holy spirit in your life, but if I can encourage you as just one brother to another, you know, use the skill that God has given you, the testimony that God's given you, um, to help people to see their way out of Calvinism from a linguistic side and from, because you've got people like white on, on the, the, Calvinistic side who are dogmatically using their Greek chops to dogmatically claim Calvinism is really the only interpretation you can come away with and you know better. So tell people, um, and, and I'm just encouraging you. I hope that you'll get out there and talk more about it maybe produce some broadcasts, maybe even some pamphlets or books or articles, whatever. Um, and, and then maybe come back on after you've produced them and, and we'll talk about it and let people know about it because I think we just need to get more resources out there. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the gospel coalition, you mentioned that that's, they were created for that purpose. You, 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 they, they got together, they call it the gospel coalition. And what they really mean by the gospel is Calvinism together for the gospel is really together for Calvinism. Because if you'll notice they have all different denominations only if they're Calvinistic, you know, so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's so they, they gather around that common sociological perspective and the other side, the Arminian provisionist side, whatever you want to call us, we have not been very good at that. And mm -hmm. so if, if I can kind of be, uh, the uh, beacon calling in the night brothers, <laughs> sisters that don't believe what Calvinism is saying, if we can at least to be together for God's provision and love for all people as Arminians provisionists, whatever you want to call us on this side of the aisle and start producing and getting out there and, and, putting out the material that people need to hear and know of God's love and provision for all men, women, boys, and girls, that God loves everyone, that no one perishes for a lack of atonement. No one is going to hell because God didn't want them, didn't pick them or created them for destruction, that they're doomed from the womb, as Calvin put it. These things are not biblical doctrines and people like you have a voice and some sense of authority in the sense of your knowledge and scholarship to be able to speak into that. So I just want to encourage you to do that if I can. Um, I really appreciate I, that. You know what? It's funny because I've had about four people in the last month basically say the same thing <laughs> of, from various uh, contexts going, Hey, mean something. you should, you should not just not with Calvinism, like Calvinism would be one thing, but just take your, take what you do and be, be a bit more public facing. And um, I think I probably will. I don't know to what degree. I have. A, I started a YouTube channel like yesterday because people. Well, no, I had a YouTube channel and people started subscribing to it, uh, even though I have no content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm just well, going, there you go. Oh, I, okay. Well, there's 1,300 that... people here right now. All 1,300 <laughs> go subscribe to Joel's content. Oh. And Joel will if you if you all subscribe, then Joel will have over a thousand, and that automatically puts you on the YouTube list, and you'll start getting you know more and more. And you, thousands, the hardest one to get to, by the way, for those. Oh, that, so the, the that thousand happens, are watching I'll, now. I promise at least one video. <laughs> <laughs> video. Y'all go do that, please. You subscribe. <laughs> uh, Idol Killer says he'll subscribe. And, uh, yeah. and so, yeah. Uh, yeah. So y'all got one or two up there. To finish what I was saying there, I, I have yeah, actually so uh, a lot of subjects that I, I think I could speak into. Um, I'm not just like, uh, I do have a scholarly career that I that takes a lot of work and time way more than I could ever spend on YouTube. Um, like I just submitted an article uh, a couple weeks ago that, like I was saying, probably took me 500 hours to work on. 
Um, that's in Hebrew Bible. That's related to literary readings of the Hebrew Bible um, and unseen literary patterns in the Hebrew Bible. Um, and so like I do a lot of a lot of things, but those relate to other things that you find on the Internet and you find people kind of contesting against so, or, or bringing up certain perspectives, I should say. Uh, and I think I could provide some value in um, seeing things from other ways or other. Th uh, yeah. So uh, I have a lot of things like that. I probably could create videos on. It's just a matter of time. I, I'm like a full time faculty member um, and no, I, I, get it. I write. I'm also publishing like I. it's just and I got a family. It's 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 a lot. So. I appreciate the the push, yeah. Layton. Well, his YouTube channel, by the way, people are asking. It's his name. If you just put at um, at Joel Koretko, yeah, yeah, at Joel Koretko, and it's it's a link in the show notes uh, on on YouTube for those that are looking for it. So you'll find him. And he doesn't have any videos up yet, but he's 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 promising actually, to do that so if you'll subscribe. Zach told so. me. So my friend Zach uh, from What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You, he said you have to put up a video before this live stream starts, and so he sent me a video, yeah. and I just put it up. <laughs> Just put it up there. There you go. Well, uh, I'm hoping that you'll get at least 1,300 because that's how many people are watching right now, that you'll get at least 1,300 subscribers and that people will start watching your broadcast so that we can get scholars like yourself known uh, from the more more provisionistic. And I'm not going to put the label provisionist on you because you may not want that label, but on the more provisionist side of things with regard to soteriology because we need more people out there doing that. Um, and so I, I appreciate your willingness to do that. And, and let me, let me, one more point of encouragement. Same thing happened with Ken Wilson, Ken Wilson, like you, it's probably you Oxford people, um, because you guys are scholars, you, you are meticulous, detailed. I mean, you just got to have it all down to the Q, especially language people. You guys are the worst. Um, I'm saying that in <laughs> yeah, love, but you, your, your, your HD, you know, uh, what do they call, um, ADHD, right? Where you just you're like yeah. hyper focused on something, or you have it, you know, or OCD. OCD is the word I'm looking for. My wife, yeah. but like that, she used to tutor Greek students. Uh, that's okay. how I met her at Hardin Simmons. Yeah. She was the Greek tutor, and she's that. She's a little bit OCD. You know, just real meticulous. She's always like, she'll find my books, my articles, and she'll go, did anybody even correct this? And she'll just find all these errors in like two seconds, and I'm like going, I had that, I had that edited six different times by people, and you still found. Yeah. So I'm married to one like you, so I understand this. <laughs> And what tends to happen with your personality, it, probably Ken Wilson's the same, is that because you're so meticulous, you'll you'll not produce content because you want it to be perfect and you'll yeah. hyper-focus on it and you'll spend hundreds of hours on something that could have been put out quicker if you weren't so OCD about it being perfect. And so I'm just encouraging you um, to, to, even if you get with a friend or with somebody that's maybe a little less OCD, just saying, I'm going to get Joel on and just interview him or whatever and make him do something right now. He doesn't have to put 5,000 hours into it to produce it uh, when it comes to YouTube stuff, even though I know you have that standard. But um, it, we're, we're getting off on a lot of different other things there. But I, I just want to encourage you, put out put out stuff because we need more people like yourself um, speaking into these things. Um, if you don't mind, I, I want to go through these starred chats real quick. Um, some of them may be questions, comments, um, but I, I promise that I would do that. So Steve, thank you for your super chats. It's a great job on the debate. Layton, hope the one string was an encouragement. Yeah, I got my one string banjo. All right. Uh, Sign of the times. What about white uh, following on a t tweet regarding substantival participles? That was more of his claim that hearing and learning are to be taken passively. Um, I think we already commented on that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. yeah. The, the, that yeah. it's a subcentival participle is not relevant, really. Um, when you're talking about hearing and learning being passive ideas, uh, concepts, that's something, that's semantics. So you need to get into, like what I was saying, like how was the, were those actions conceptualized? And you're going to have to go as well to like the parallel ideas you find in John to to, to talk about that. So um, that it's a substantive part, but the part of the pool is not particularly relevant. Good deal. All right. Thank you for that. Uh, Jody, thank you for your super chat. It's his first time giver, a long time listener. Appreciate that, brother. Uh, there's Derek. Finally finished the debate. Well done, sir. All right, Derek. Thank you, brother. Uh, and, and Derek's one of those guys that would tell me if he didn't like something, he, he, he'll he bring critique occasionally too. So a lot of people think, you know, that people are on, on the provisionist side are just fanboys or just agree with everything. I was like, do you know these people? I mean, there's, a, I get critiques all the time from my listeners, uh, of sometimes too many is so just, just so you know, uh, Jody, thank you for your super chat. Can some words in the Bible be figures of speech? For example, if I say, I could kill a hamburger. I don't mean that I think hamburgers are alive. Literally, can some verses be misunderstood? 
I guess that would um, be a question for you. Yeah, I don't think I understand the, the question. Well, uh, like yes. like like idioms or like he driving me up the wall or I've got cold yeah, feet. Yeah, well, I mean, are there, are there those kinds of things that, in Greek as well? All language, like, yeah, that you're going to find that everywhere in, in languages. Yeah, we the way we describe the world is mostly in metaphor anyways. And so, yeah, um, yes, I'm sorry. I don't quite understand what they're trying to get me to comment on there. Yeah, no, I, I think that you answered it. I think it's just, he's just talking about how di- different... Um, metaphors or uh idioms can be used in any language and sometimes yeah. interpretation involves knowing what those idioms are seeing them in context so yeah, that, yeah that's and, true and connotations that will come with a word when it's used um and so like we have certain connotations that will come with with a, a term that that um is apparent in our living context but back then they might have other connotations that come with a word that you have to really do serious study to figure out um, what's uh, if there are um, I mean like if I say uh, hey Leighton Flowers was cancelled yesterday uh, people immediately think oh like like Twitter cancelled like like because that, that's the the cognitive frames is what you'd call it like the, what comes right, right. to mind um, when and 20 when years I ago we wouldn't that. have known we wouldn't no, know exactly that yeah and so you have those these are all things that need to be considered when you're interpreting a text and it's i get it, it's a lot of work and that's what scholars are for in this respect because that's not for everybody that's not the, for the right. person so good commentaries will help you here yeah that's great dw thank you for your super chat um, james model of learning is designed to affirm determinism and is thus understood as me- mechanical learning which is applicable to the newtonian mechanics robots etc um, kind of maybe seems like that in, in some ways. Do you have any comment on that, Joel? Um, no, again, I'm having a hard time following it, but, uh, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I, I'm having a hard time following this one. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it's, it's, I think, I think basically he's just trying to say that Dr. White, James's model, um, or his way of understanding things tends to start with or assume determinism. And so when he sees the word like learning, he just reads into that word being made to learn. Uh, when when the grammar semantically, grammatically, whatever you want to say, is not necessarily, you know, saying determinism is true. You have to be reading that into it. Um, wow. Christopher, thank you for your super chat. Would love to have your opinion on the Greek word for faith, belief, I guess would be pistis, right? And hope um, and how the root of the word piss means to be persuaded or convinced mm. yeah well you don't want to etymologize that's the lexical fallacy that you're that, that could be um involved in this so just because something comes from a root um that you don't want to derive the, the meaning from that root rather you want to derive meaning from how the word is used in a given context and so um i mean can i think of something i mean like the word understand to stand under well, it's like, well, no, no, it's not, it's, it, that's, no one thinks that it's a matter of how is something used in context currently. Um, and so um, I wouldn't go back. I don't typically do etymological arguments, although in my book, actually, I, I had to do one for, for one thing, but I do preface it saying this very, um, I understand what I'm doing here. I'm just trying to get closer to the meaning of a term that had been, in my opinion, um, misdefined in the past. Hmm. Uh, anyways, uh, yeah, uh, p- pistao, pistis, the noun, so pistao is the, the, the verbal form, pistevo, I would actually, I'd pronounce it that way, and pistis, uh, yeah, I mean, it means faith, trust, allegiance, something like that, um, that's how I understand it, El piso, I got hope, in, I got in trouble for using the word allegiance sometime back, and, and, um, because I, I thought allegiance was a really good word for English, uh, mm-hmm. kind of capturing the word, but mm-hmm. I, I remember getting some pushback, a lot of flack for using that word. But I think it's yeah, I still I mean, think it's a good word. It is, and there's a guy who wrote his whole he wrote a book on it, uh, Matthew Bates. Bates uh, it's a controversial title for some uh, faith by allegiance alone or salvation by allegiance alone. And so, um, like, the, he's just trying to help us understand wh- again what were the connotations of this term, how was this term used in the first century, uh, and so he would kind of push towards the allegiance idea. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm fine which, with trust. Which goes yeah. really well with the word sovereign because the word sovereign it refers to a king mm-hmm. and your allegiance to a king, allegiance to a sovereign, which has nothing 100%. to do with determinism, <laughs> determinism whatsoever. It has to do with 100%. allegiance to the yes. king. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a matrix of ideas and concepts. Yeah. Right. 
All right, Ben, thank you for your super chat, brother. Uh, John 6, 31 quotes Nehemiah 9, 15, bread from heaven. The context of that is Nehemiah 9, 8 says God found faith, not gave faith in Abraham's heart. Is this context relevant for John 6, 44, an unconditional election? Um, I would, uh, my initial, I don't know, I can get Joel's thoughts on it, but my initial reaction is to say it's definitely relevant because it's not the assumption that God gives faith by some effectual means, but that instead to those who have faith, to those who believe in him, he's going to teach them and they're going to come to the son um, is, is the way I would understand John 6, 44 and 45 in that context is that the reason he's drawing them is because they have faith, um, not because he's effectually caused them to have faith. You want to comment on that at all, Joel? Uh, I'm actually just looking up the verse. Sorry. You'll have to keep talking for a second. Yeah, no worries. I know you referenced Nehemiah um, because I'd referenced Nehemiah 930 with the word Meshach uh, as as a potential for the word draw, but you were saying that actually mm -hmm. there's some other passages from the Old Covenant that would might have been better, even better word that the word Helco would have been uh, used in the yeah. Septuagint at least. And that is definitely your, your field of study. Yeah, so uh, I was just looking up Nehemiah 915. Uh, there is... Potentially, it could be the wording could be drawn from there, um, but most, uh, from what I understand, I don't want to say most excited. It could also be drawn from Psalm seventy-eight. Um, that that's what you'll find, like in the references in in the NA twenty-eight, so the Greek version of the New Testament that many scholars use. Um, that the reference because the, the wording is very similar in both Nehemiah and nine fifteen. I just looked it up and and Psalm seventy-eight, and so uh, I'm not sure which one. Um, it should be from, uh, it would have to be, you'd have to do, I'd have to do more work in that exactly. Um, and yeah, I'm not, I don't want to comment on it until I do that. Um, but I had assumed it was from Psalm 78 cause the wording is so similar. Um, and the themes are so similar. Um, that said, when you were talking about drawing in Nehemiah, uh, yeah, I, all I did was pointed you to Jeremiah 31 where the same term Helco is used of drawing. Uh, it's the only prophetic context where God draws, as far as I'm aware, um, in that sense, um, and in the sense that we're talking about. And so I had said to you, hey, why not go there? Because that's a better context for Helco rather than drawing it from, no, no, no pun intended, <laughs> yeah, from, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Nehemiah, from, yeah, Nehemiah, from Nehemiah, yeah, um, which uh, I also said, perhaps it's not the best translation that you provided. Um, yeah, and I think, I, I, honestly, I think I, if I remember correctly, Michael Brown is where I'd gotten that from. And he actually quoted two different passages. And so he may have quoted Jeremiah. I don't remember, but he's a Hebrew scholar. And so he may have quoted three or four. And I, because of my length of my time, I may have pulled one of them, whereas he related them to each other somehow because of the word Meshach, I think, which were, was used in several of those texts that had that same kind of context of God drawing uh, using the word Meshach there, but um, the people not listening. Therefore, it's their fault for not listening. Um, and, but you're, I'm, I'm sure you're right as far as, uh, which, which, which one of the, um, terms would have been better or verses would have been better. Um, Todd, thank you for your super chat. John 17, 17 brought me out of Calvinism quote. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak on my own authority, anyone, uh, anyone is anyone, not some. Yeah. And I, I actually quote that in my book. That's one verse that I do use and I almost used in the opener just had to I had to pick and choose which ones I used and that's a big another big one if you will to follow the father if you're following his will then you're going to know you know that I'm from God it's the same theme that you see repeated over and over and over again which is why I don't find it very convincing when he says you're reading it backwards because this is a theme that John repeats over and over again there's nothing you're reading backwards because it's a theme that's already been established well before John 6 and it's repeated over and over again so why uh, you don't need to read something backwards to get that theme. Um, you want to comment on that at all? Uh, no, I just, uh, yeah, I think that what you're saying here is similar to what you were saying late and what I kind of pointed out earlier, the, the matrix of ideas and that it's well established in Johannine scholarship that um, John is repeating himself and using different images. And so you have to take these ideas together. And like you said, earlier than John six, these are already established. Um, and yeah. it's the same discourse to the Jews in it, it's to both to Jews in the same context. Um, and so 
you have to read this together. It's meant to be a, a discourse that, uh, and a set sets of passages and scenes that connect to each other uh, because it is uh, Jesus speaking to the same group. Well, well said. Uh, Zugi Michaels, thank you for your super chat. Dr. Flowers, hope all is well and you're in big hugs. Does foreknowledge mean knowledge of the future or does it mean having knowledge for a long period of time? Please help me clarify this in light of the New Testament text, maybe Romans. Um, Joel, do you want to comment on that? I've got thoughts on it I can give, but do you want to say something about that? Yeah, prognorizo. Um, yeah, it means to, to know beforehand. And what you know beforehand, how you know beforehand, will be determined on context. And so that brings I, up a, we, a lot of questions for me. I'd love to get you back on uh, and maybe even talk to Romans 8, uh, 28 and following and my interpretation of it, because I, I don't know if you believe the same thing I do with regard to Prognosco there and that in re reference there. With the errors even, there? Errors tense there? Yeah, errors there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so um, I, I'd, I'd be interested, but we don't have time right now. So we'll, we'll have to, we'll have to put that on a pin that to the side because I'll, I, that would be a fun discussion with you. I, I would be interested mm. to hear your thoughts. Um, Danielle uh, Edwards, thank you for your super chat. Uh, yes, please. I would love to see you put out more content already to subscribe. There you go. You got at least one subscriber, two, three over there that have already All commented. Right. So um, great debate. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Appreciate that. Um, Jose, thank you for your super chat. Uh, Jose Diaz says, great job on the debate late and I'm subscribing to Joel's channel and hoping that he puts up content. Um, and so you've already got some subscribers over there. So right there on. you go. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing and seeing more from you, Joel. Um, it's been a great, uh, getting to know you and hearing a little bit more of your story and I've got your number now, or at least I've got you on messenger. So when I get uh, stuck in a linguistic issue that I need help with, I know, uh, I know who I can uh, call out to and <laughs> maybe get some input. I've got some other guys too, but uh, I, I love to have a, another one on the, uh, yeah, on the I'm dial. Happy. So. I'm, I'm always available. I'm, I'll get to it if I, if, obviously if I can, but uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm happy to be of any of a, of a resource to you. Yeah. No, well, thanks brother. Well, and thank you all for tuning in. I appreciate, uh, I, I don't, I don't know, Joel, you may have said, a, I don't mm -hmm. know. I can't remember a time we've ever been over 1400 on a live there's chat. 1400 people watching. I, I don't have any, I'm not viewing any of this right now. I sorry. Yeah, I haven't been watching comments or anything. I actually just saw that I could turn the comments on and I saw yeah, someone yeah, say, yeah. are you Polish? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, my last name is Polish. Uh, I don't, I don't have any really other uh, affinity with that other than I know it means little trough. And yeah, yeah. so apparently my ancestors made little troughs for small pigs or something a long time ago. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a Polish last name. <laughs> well, and, and in Portuguese, my name, Le Leighton, is actually pronounced Leighton, according to my aunt, who was a missionary in Portugal. And I can only thank her for telling my two older brothers this piece of information. But Leighton in Portuguese means little pig. And so my brothers, that was my nickname from my older brother. To this day, my oldest brother, Hayden, calls me LP for little pig. And so uh, that, that's that been my nickname my entire life. So we got the trough and the little pig. Yeah. There we right go. here together, we, we're made. <laughs> together. Funny stuff. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that we've never got over. I, I can't ever remember time. We're not usually over. We, we've been over a thousand several times, but never over 1400 for sure. So really congratulations, cool. Joel. People love you. Uh, apparently they're here, here uh, to see you. <laughs> if you knew me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I appreciate you coming on. Uh, Joel didn't uh, divulge this to the, the chat, but prior he said, I, I finally, I woke up with a cold or something that your kids had had. And so yeah. you, you said, I may have to run off the screen real quick because I'm not feeling really well, but you've endured and you've done a great job for over two hours when we were only going to go an hour and a half or so. So thank you for your time. I, I, oh. you're, I know your time's valuable and I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to do this and appreciate you coming on and look forward to seeing much more from you, Joel. God bless you, brother. Well, thanks, Layton. Go now, share Christ and show love. God bless.